Nathan Stark was to be played by Martin Lee. James Scott chose the man not only because of his mounting popularity, but also because of his somber aura, which was absolutely similar to Nathan Stark's. However, this character, Diana Stark, was the most difficult to create. Diana Stark was a kind and innocent girl. She was green, youthful, cute, and lively. From a young age, she was well protected by Nathan Stark, so she still retained her otherworldly innocence. This disposition was really hard to depict. Even a masterful actress with a lot of experience might be unable to bring about this character's particular trait. James Scott was quite depressed. The people on the name list, no matter how outstanding their appearances were, were not THE Diana Stark in his heart. Just when James Scott was feeling troubled, his assistant, who was plastered on the car window, suddenly exclaimed, Director, quickly take a look over there. That girl wearing a snowy white dress. She looks so much like Diana Stark. He looked in the direction that his assistant had pointed to. His eyes could not help but quake, followed by his body, and then he excitedly leaned forward. Under the rays of the morning sun, in the warm wind, a small and charming figure stood quietly by the building entrance. The young lady was so beautiful, she seemed to have walked out of a mural. She attracted the attention of those in the van in just a short while. Wow. The assistant was so shocked, he reflexively held his breath. He had never seen such a youthful girl before. The girl looked young, even having a somewhat green feeling. She wore a long, clean dress with her fair and delicate arms and shoulders visible. She appeared to be pure and enchanting. She wore such a simple dress, yet unexpectedly appeared extremely cockish. She was so beautiful, she seemed ethereal, and people were unknowingly moved by her. She did not have a sexy figure like other women. In fact, she had a frail frame that was not voluptuous. She was so delicate, it seemed water could flow out of her with a pinch. However, despite this, she was still able to capture the attention of many. For some reason, although she was wearing a dress, which could not be any more normal, within the bustling crowd at the entrance, she still managed to stand out among better-dressed women. James Scott's keen eyes squinted. In this ordinary world, there was still such beauty? His heart trembled with excitement, and he hurriedly grabbed his binoculars by the side. The girl stood at the entrance, holding a small handbag in her hand. Her hair, like brocade, softly landed on her shoulders. She emitted a breathtaking radiance under the lights. Beneath her bangs was an absolutely gorgeous face. She had smooth, jade-like skin, an alluring almond-shaped face, and supple red cheeks. Her peach eyes, which slanted upward at the ends, were cast down. They were absolutely charming. She had a row of thick, long, curly eyelashes that were stretched like a comb with densely packed pins, as if they were top-quality black feathers. They seemed to flutter like butterfly wings. They were extremely alluring. Her soft, pinkish lips were like fresh petals, dazzling and cute. Monica was pondering on something with her head down and brows slightly knitted. Suddenly, she had this strange feeling that someone was staring at her. Returning to her senses, she seemed to feel that the eyes looking at her from head to toe were in that distant nanny van as she slowly turned to look in that direction. At that moment, James Scott's eyes involuntarily darkened, and he was breathless for a split second. The lady's pair of eyes, with shades of black and white distinct, was moist like the water in a well, showing the reflection of a lone This bottomless well seemed to reflect off beautiful moonlight quiet and shimmering on its surface. The moment their eyes met, the girl suddenly became flustered. Agitated, she tightly clenched her handbag as she bit her lower lip and started pacing about. However, it was precisely this natural expression of hers that made one think that she was quite cute. Diana Stark. James Scott was suddenly overwhelmed with admiration. This girl was simply Diana Stark in the flesh. Thrilled, James Scott reached his hand out to grab the name list he had thrown aside and asked excitedly, Is this girl from the university? Did she apply? Go search for her name. Immediately inform her to come to the audition. Director. Huh? James Scott lifted his head and saw his assistant's confused look. We can just get out of the car and personally invite that girl to the audition. It will be less work that way, he suggested, feeling helpless. This director, was he way too excited? James Scott tapped his head and said, Oh, yes, 
Why didn't I think of that? It will truly be less work that way. He immediately got off the car, but when he looked in the girl's direction, she was already gone. Did she disappear? Wasn't she standing there moments ago? James Scott knitted his brows tightly, and he searched for her in the crowd, but there was no trace of her. She was gone, just like that. The interview for an artist's assistance was very simple. Filling out a form and handing in a few identity documents, she then officially got the job. The manager informed her that she could report for work the next day. The paycheck and benefits were rather generous. Although it was a strenuous job, and she would undoubtedly be subjected to persecutions, Monica was already jumping for joy. Just as she was about to leave, the manager fixed her with a strange look and asked, You have an outstanding appearance. So why did you apply to be an artist's assistant? For the pity. If this girl were to be refined a little more, she would definitely make a name for herself in the entertainment industry. Monica smiled but did not comment. Before she left, she was given a data sheet. The artist she was responsible for was a not-to-be-taken-lightly newbie called Miley Cooper. It was stated that the artist should not be taken lightly because she had a powerful backer, which let her rise up in status. It was also rumored that she had clinched quite a substantial role for herself. Under Rosie's expectant gaze, Emma entered the house with a downcast face. Seeing this, she quickly got up to ask her daughter about the audition. But when she noticed her low spirits, her heart could not help but go cold. What happened? At her daughter's despondent look, she hurriedly probed. Did you fail the audition? Did the director not choose you? Emma felt indignant. <laughs> with my aptitude... How can I not pass the audition? Even if I'm not chosen as a female lead for this movie, other directors will surely take a fancy to me. Then what's up with the long face? Rosie noticed her mumbling and felt even more agitated. After her repeated probing, Emma eventually revealed the truth. She originally went for the audition with confidence. Clothes, makeup, everything was in the proper place. For this audition, she even reread the original novel for a few days and memorized the script thoroughly. She had even chosen the most tear-jerking scene in the script, practicing it repeatedly in front of the mirror. She thought that she had the character down pat. However, when she went to the audition brimming with confidence, she was immediately informed at the entrance that she could not participate in the selection without a letter of interview. However, in the promotional short for the female lead role of The Forbidden Love, it was repeatedly mentioned that the audition was open nationwide. Regardless of identity, as long as one was of age and a legal citizen, anyone could participate in the audition. Why was she refused for the reason of interview then? Episode 22, $20,000 Why was she prevented from auditioning? Just because she did not have an interview letter? The head of the crew told her that this was a last-minute decision made by the director. Upon seeing the many people who had come to the venue either to audition for the role or to show their support for the superstar Martin Lee. Thus, Emma, who was already blocked at the door, could only watch those with audition letters enter the site. She was brimming with confidence when she came and would concede defeat to were rejected during the audition without even being given a chance to such an outcome. She was expectedly vexed at this turn of events. Rosie asked her daughter, What is this audition letter? Can we get our hands on it? How do we acquire one? Emma sighed. I've asked around. We need to pull strings. She paused briefly before continuing. Although this is an open audition, there are still some hurdles that need to be overcome. The audition letters are invitations, either distributed by the production crew or given by influential people in the show business. Many entertainment companies had naturally heard of this rare opportunity and went all out to give their second-rated models a chance to audition for the role in hopes of one of them becoming the next successful Miley Cooper. The benchmarks were high this time. Is there really no chance for you to acquire this letter? This was too much of a shock for Rosie. She had put so much effort and placed a lot of expectation on her daughter, hoping for her to become famous one day. Now, this dream was no more. A thought suddenly struck Emma, and her eyes brightened. She thought of someone. Don't worry, I have an idea. Night fell. Monica was helping Andres with his school's contact book when her handphone rang. 
She picked up the call absentmindedly. The background noises she heard from the other end seemed to suggest that the call was made from a nightclub or a pub. Hello? Hello? She raised an eyebrow in confusion. There was no answer from the phone. She was about to hang up when a coarse male voice asked, Are you my sister? Uh, yes. The man said, I'm too drunk and I can't wake her up. Can you come over and pick her up? Emma again? Why is she always getting into trouble? She really wanted to refuse, as she had no desire to clean up her adoptive sister's mess anymore. Her adoptive sister did what she liked to her and Andres on other days, and then she indirectly caused her to lose her job. What more did she want from her? She was drunk, but what did it have to do with her? This was when the weather-beaten face of her father flashed through her mind. Monica could not help but clench her fists and stood motionless for quite some time. The man on the phone did not hear a reply from her and repeated, Hello? A few times. Hello? Monica gave a long, suffering sigh and asked, Hello? Where? Club Nash. Club Nash was a well-known nightclub in the capital. It was famous for its extravagance and expensiveness. Most of its patrons were expectedly rich and influential, but it also had no shortage of local ruffians who would come there to have fun. Simply put, Club Nash was notorious for being chaotic. Drug abuse, gambling, and shady trading, once it was nighttime, it became a den for illegal businesses and deals. There was always news of shout-outs with heavy casualties involving that place. Yet, despite it being chaotic and having no social security, Club Nash, unlike other similar nightclubs, still managed to remain in business due to it having a very strong and influential backer. Even the police did not dare to touch it arbitrarily. As soon as Monica stepped into this foul place, she choked on the pungent smoke within. As she walked by, she saw men and women having adventures with their bodies. The air was filled with an overwhelming foul smell. The private rooms have groups of people giving in to sensual pleasures. Under a waiter's lead, she walked into the private room the man on the phone had mentioned to her. She had just stepped foot inside the room, and her nose was immediately assailed by a fishy odor mixed with alcohol and smoke. The room was filled entirely with fumes. The sound systems were on full blast. A few hooligans with the trendiest hairstyles were stripped to their waists, drowning themselves in alcohol. Sweeping her eyes across the room, she immediately caught sight of the tipsy Emma lying on one side of the sofa. She was out cold. Some of the hooligans sensed her arrival and consecutively lifted their heads, whistling lewdly. Whoa, she really came. Hmm, this chick is quite pretty. She's got a nice body to boot. She looks better than those pitches anyway. She heard someone chime in. True. You don't see that many gals that's innocent looking these days. I wonder how she's like in bed. But she's splendid. Those foul words that were unpleasant to the ear. Monica listened to their ruggish words and felt her heart slightly tremble. She heard a bang and realized that the waiter behind her had courteously shut the door. She stood there a little awkwardly, unable to move a step. Honestly speaking, after her previous encounter with those thugs at her last job, she developed a fear of them. Thus, right now, she really wanted to leave, and she moved to do just that. A man with a sleeve tattoo of a green dragon stood up and stared at her from across the table. He strode toward her and gripped her wrist at once. He said with a wry smile, Leaving when you've just arrived? What about your little sis? She hesitantly shifted her gaze between the door and Emma, and mustered the courage to say, Oh, I'll take her back. We're leaving. Leaving just like this? The man smirked and creased his brows. Don't go yet. You'll ruin the fun. Come have a drink with us first. The man latched onto her shoulders. He pointed to a few men on the sofa and said, Come on, let me introduce you. This is the boss of the street where this bar is at, Frank Utes. Beside him is Clark, and that one is Bob. Monica was unable to remain standing still. She broke free from the man's restraining hold and said, I'm not here to drink. I'm here to take Emma home. Hearing this, the man scoffed. Not drinking? Okay, then. Do something else with me. His greedy eyes glanced at her chest, and then he reached out his hand for her face. She instinctively ducked his groping hand, shocked by his actions. She knitted her brows and demanded coldly, What are you trying to do? What am I trying to do? I'm trying to help you, of course. The man tilted his head and replied in a somewhat joking manner. 
Behind him, a man with a knife star on his face yelled, This person, what's her name? Monica, right? Don't just stand there like an idiot. Come sit over here. Let the waiter pop more bottles of whiskey for you. She vehemently shook her head and then hesitantly glanced at Emma. I'm not drinking. I'm leaving. After spouting these words, she turned to leave. The man with good reflexes grabbed her wrist and forcefully dragged her back. She cried out in fear and started to fiercely struggle. But how could she overpower the man gripping her wrist with her meager strength? He lewdly eyed her from head to toe and said with disappointment, Hey, don't be like that, okay? The sister of yours is still young and green. So as her older sister, shouldn't you teach her the rules of this world? She knitted her brows. What do you mean? What do I mean? The man chuckled. Someone behind him sneered. Your sister, who doesn't know the rules, came to us for some powder without money and stuck with us every day. She owes us $20,000. No more, no less. Episode 23, An Ominous Premonition What do you mean? The man chuckled. Someone behind him sneered. Your sister, who doesn't know the rules, came to us for some powder without money and stuck with us every day. She owes us $20,000. No more, no less. $20,000? Monica was stunned. She felt her mind buzz as her eyes widened in disbelief. She thought that Emma was just in her rebellious phase and often went outside to only have fun, so she never put much thought into her actions. She assumed that she was simply hanging out with some gangsters and would get herself in the right mind sooner or later. Never did she expect that she would be wild enough to dare play with drugs. She even owed these people $20,000. The sum of $20,000. Selling off their father's condominium might not even be enough to pay it off. She stood rooted to the spot, her body as stiff as a stone. The man blabbered on beside her. Has no money and still dares to play with drugs. What a turn-off. You tell me. How am I supposed to get this money back? Don't tell me we have to knock on your door to collect it. The man called Frank Utes, who was high from holding a sexy woman in his arm, removed the cigarette between his lips and stubbed it out with a grin. Since the younger sis can't pay us back, surely the older sis can pay it for her. Her eyes darkened. I... I don't have that much money, let alone $20,000. She would be unable to pay them, even if the amount was $2,000 or $200. The man stared at her with disappointment. No money? Tom, this chick said she's got no money. The sum of $2,000 is not small. Hearing this, Frank gave a salacious smile. No money? Pay with something else, then. The man immediately understood the other's intention. Lowering his head, he lewdly eyed her and he was very satisfied with what he saw. Oh. With your fine looks, accompanying me for a few days should be enough to pay off your sister's debts. You should feel honored, little missy. Those women outside can't even pique our interest like you do. No, she firmly refused. The man was so furious that he laughed. He lightly tapped her cheek and pointed to Frank Utes. You should know your place and learn how to appreciate the pleasurable things in life. Know who this is? He's the boss of the street where this nightclub is. Yet you dared to refuse his offer? Are you courting death? He forcefully overwhelmed her and pinned her onto the sofa. Frank immediately pulled her over. With one hand, he poured out a glass of whiskey. He proceeded to stain his fingers with white powder and smear the rim of the glass with it before passing it over to her. Drops of alcohol splattered all over the table. Drink this. She gazed at the glass of alcohol and was almost hyperventilated. I... I don't know how to drink. Forget whiskey. She did not even dare to drink beer. Her body had a special constitution. One gulp of any alcoholic beverage would knock her out. If she took so much as one sip of this liquor, she would surely be unable to get out of this room at all. Frank clucked his tongue, his bushy brows furrowing deeply. Why? Now willing to give me face? I really can't drink. At a loss, she tightly clasped her hands together. Follow my order while I'm still being nice to you. Frank noticed that being nice did not work on her, so he signaled the man beside him with a gaze. Understanding his intention, 
The lackey moved over and gripped her chin. He then pried her lips apart and poured the alcohol in the glass into her mouth. Accompanied by the rich smell of alcohol, mouthfuls of whiskey quickly flowed down her throat. This caught her by surprise. She suffocated and choked on the alcohol. The liquor burned as it traveled down her throat, causing her face to turn beet red and her eyes to tear up. Unknown to where she got the strength, she managed to push the man away. The glass shattered into pieces on the floor. She desperately held her throat with her hip bent over and had a violent coughing fit that caused her to vomit several times. As if a fire was raging from within, she felt a strong burning sensation in her stomach. Pure whiskey had an absolutely strong kick and a considerable delayed effect. She only drank half a glass, yet her vision was already swimming. Her head was spinning, and her entire world was upside down. Her head was spinning so badly that she could barely get her bearings as her consciousness gradually slipped away. She tried to stand, yet she swayed on her feet. Her entire body turned to jelly as her limbs went limp and horribly numb. She got up, but quickly fell on the sofa. Right after, a boiling sensation surged from her tummy, as if the fire within her body was raging fiercer. Drenched in a feverish sweat, she desperately held the edge of the table. It was no wonder that she got drunk so fast. For the liquor's kick to be this strong, another substance was probably mixed into it. Frank lewdly grinned, revealing his yellowish teeth. This love hunting power is truly potent. <laughs> It's a given, since I'm the one who got it. Why would it not be good? The man smiled sinisterly. He then looked over to Monica, whose face was contorted in pain, and his heart itched badly. Tom, when you're done with this chick, can you let us play with her for a few days, too? This woman has a face that can cause a disaster. All right, when I'm done with her, she's all yours. A few of them nodded and bowed as they laughed politely. Thank you, Tom. Tom said, I've already booked a room for you. <laughs> Residential suite. Lying on the sofa, Emma opened her eyes and sat up. Where on her face were signs of intoxication? Her vision was obviously crystal clear. She took a glance at Monica, who had lost her consciousness, and her lips curved up into a sneer. Frank, are you satisfied with this? How is she? I didn't lie to you, did I? Look, she's worth what I owe you, right? Emma went over to sit beside him and said coyly, The sister of mine is downright innocent. Compared to those sly foxes at the counter, her body is totally pure as well. If you throw her into the black market, she can be sold for at least a few hundred thousand dollars per night. Frank, you earn lots of money. Indeed. She'll definitely be priced high. Okay, we're even. You don't owe me anything now. Let alone a few hundred thousand dollars. She is worth even a few million dollars. Frank Utes roared inside him as he hugged Monica. He was clearly very satisfied with her. All right. Pleasure to be doing business with you, Frank, Emma said. Thinking of something, she lowered her voice. Frank, don't tell anyone about me. Don't let her find out that I'm the one behind this. My dad will kill me. I get it, he answered impatiently. She giggled. Take it slow. She's yours for the entire night. So take your time. The audition for the female lead. Don't worry. I'll keep my promise. All right, get out. Don't disturb my good time. Frank was fully focused on Monica's body now, so why would he bother to give Emma his attention? He did not give it much thought and just nodded his head. Some of his men already had the door open for him. He embraced parts of Monica's body in his arms and left the room. All of a sudden, the wind raged outside. The windows and doors were clattering from the gale. Andres woke up from his nightmare. He sat up in his bed at once and looked to his side. His mommy was gone. Mommy! An ominous premonition rose from his chest. Episode 24 the potency of the love hunting powder. Crown Hotel. Within the presidential suite, what one could see were luxurious fixtures, stylish, elegant, and extravagant to the core. At a VIP table in the banquet hall, Stefan expressionlessly looked at the ugly faces of hypocrisy around him as irritability bubbled within him. 
Unknowingly, the bottle of wine was half emptied, and the sky outside the window had turned dark. He was more annoyed with those around him than tired. He downed the rest of the vodka in his glass and stood up. When the others saw this, they exchanged glances and stood up as well. It was the star of tonight's celebration. Stephen Lewis, leaving, meant that this banquet was over. As the director and CEO of Makewell's financial group, he had a lofty status and held the highest authority in the Lewis group. In the midst of the current global economic crisis and facing the onslaught of his financial turmoil, the lifeline of their small companies was in the Lewis group's hands. The life and death of their petty enterprises depended on his words. Therefore, they were full of praise for the future master of Lewis Group and served him with care. One person whispered tentatively, Master Lewis, you leaving? The man then respectfully handed over his coat. Stefan glanced at him and swiftly put the coat on. Someone else carefully pushed open the banquet door for him. He sauntered out of the banquet hall with confident strides. Behind him, a row of men in suits bowed. The scene was akin to a glamorous star being worshipped by fanatics. Stefan strode in as the doors to the VIP elevator parted open. He nonchalantly glanced at a spot as the doors were closing, and his eyes constricted with shock. Frank, who was holding an unconscious Monica in his arms, smugly got off the elevator and subsequently felt a chill run up and down his spine. He looked around and saw the closing doors of the VIP elevator. At that moment, from the crack of the elevator doors, he vaguely caught a pair of piercing eyes. He neither took it to heart nor gave it much thought. He heaved and held Monica in one arm. Using his now free hand, he opened the presidential suite with the door card and walked inside. Behind him, the doors to the VIP elevator gradually parted open again. Frank swiftly swiped the card and kicked the door open. As soon as he entered the door without locking it, he hurriedly fumbled off his belt and pulled down his pants. He lightly tapped Monica's cheek and leered impatiently. He shut the door with a back kick as his mind got filled with lascivious thoughts of being on top of the world on the big bed later. Emma Thames, that chick, was not lying. When he heard that she had a stunning older sister before, he would often dismiss it with a scoff. Women were all the same tools he could use to satisfy his urges. Looking at her now, she was more outstanding than the description. She was different from the average woman and possessed a unique charm. He had seen women more beautiful than her, yet her pure and elegant aura outclassed them all. He threw her on the soft, king-sized bed, her wondrous curves slowly sinking into it. Under the dim wall lamp on the pristine bed, in black sling dress, her fair and tender skin glowed with more beauty. Her messy hair seductively spread around her shoulders as her cleavage became slightly visible. The beauty that loomed before his eyes were so tantalizing and captivating. He became more aroused the longer he looked. Monica slightly regained consciousness. She felt her guts overturn as her body curled up with great discomfort. Her small hands fumbled to strip off her clothes. She wanted to remove all the things covering her body because of that strange heat within her. Her inhibition and rationality were not functioning properly. She did not know or care where she was and only felt herself drowning in a deep furnace. Her lower abdomen was on fire, but her body was inexplicably cool. One side was icy cold, and another side was menacingly hot. It was like being overlapped in two different worlds of fire and ice. The oh, it's so hot! It's so hot! Save me! Save me, please! Frank watched all this. Thank you for watching. It was pleasure. Please don't forget Most to subscribe. Hunting was the most terrifying date rape drug available on the black market. One could not get this good thing without special connections. With just a sip, not even a chaste woman with a strong will could resist its potency. Flight of not having a man was hell. This was even more so for this unworldly lady. She wriggled on the bed in great torment. Unknowingly, the action made her appear more alluring. Frank rushed to remove his clothes. With his pants still hanging on his legs, he crawled into the bed with excitement. He could not wait to jump her. Little beauty, don't move. I'll help you. I'll make you comfortable in a little while. Hey. At this moment, the doorbell rang. He momentarily halted his actions 
as his expression contorted with an unwillingness to do so. He was suitably aroused now. Nothing could be more frustrating for someone in his state than being disturbed mid-action. Hell-bent on completing the deed, he ignored the folks outside the door. However, just as he unbuttoned the first clasp of her dress, the doorbell rang again, and again, and again, with mounting impatience. In the capital, he considered himself as number one in the circle. Who the hell was trying to spoil his fun right now? What a damn wet blanket! His eyes flashed with rage, flipped his head to the side, and gave himself a hard spat. After speedily putting on his pants without a shirt, he went to open the door. He was swearing when he opened the door. He lifted his head and saw two beefy men in black suits towering over the door, almost fluting the light from the hallway. His livid face sank as his eyes flashed with a hint of terror. He might be a seasoned gangster, and had seen a lot of this world, yet the two's oppressive aura still managed to intimidate him. The two emanated a terrifying aura with their murderous eyes and looked like ruthless, bloodthirsty killers. He gulped and carefully sized them up. You, you, you. W what do you guys want? You've got the wrong guy. Without a word, the two men reached out their hands and lifted him out of the door. Each one had a hand around his neck and hefted him up like a prisoner. He was startled and started to curse. What are you doing? What do you want with me? You're ruining my good time. I'm from the east side. You know what that means? You'd better let me go. I bought that woman for $20,000. Let me go. Oh, let me go. The bellow slowly faded away. Episode 25 It is just like that time we first met. The bellow slowly faded away. Monica heaved herself into a sitting position with great effort. She lifted her heavy head and swept her blurry eyes around. She felt as if the whole world were tumbling down. She seemed to have lost full control of her body as it became pliant with heat. Seeing no one around her, she couldn't care less where she was. This torture had taken away her last strand of rationality. She reached out with quivering hands and painstakingly tore her dress. This was when a tall figure stepped through the door. The man had a compelling demeanor, and the instant he appeared in the suite, the whole world seemed to condense. The door closed with a bang, and the room was once more engulfed in darkness. Inside the spacious suite, her hurried and strangled gasps echoed about. The labored breathing, accompanied by soft moans, continued to pass through her pale red lips. Everything was full of coyness. Everything was so unbearable. Her body seemed to have a huge piece missing, and nothing was able to fill that void. Her arms flailed in the air, as if she were trying to catch hold of something to stuff in her. Yet, she herself could not tell what her body needed. It was so hollow and so empty. She felt so hollow and empty inside that she seemed to have fallen into the abyss. She reached out and held her body tightly, hoping that she could restrain the consuming lust with each strong grasp. However... With every touch, her body was merely tickled with thrill and uncontrollable excitement. Stefan threaded through the darkness and slowly made his way to her. When he reached the side of the king-sized dog, he stood there with a bowed head. Under the retro light fixture, the white quilt entangled at her waist. Monica was unkempt and disheveled at this point. The black shoulder straps of her dress had slid down her delicate shoulders. Her face was strangely blushing. Her eyes were constantly blinking, and her hands were weakly tugging at the dress. She appeared to be in great pain. He motionlessly eyed her until the black of his eyes deepened. He had never imagined that their next meeting would be under such circumstances. That man before said that he had bought her for $20,000. Was the remuneration he had given her six years ago not enough that she would sell her body like this? Or was she this kind of woman to begin with? She hungered for more money and power that she would willingly exchange her body for both. Was he her first customer? How many men had touched her body since then? He pursed his lips in distaste. His clear eyes hid a trace of bitterness. With a touch of disgust, he moved to walk away. Behind him, she somehow found the strength to sit up in the bed. Stretching out her arms desperately, she managed to circle his waist tightly from the back. She would not let go. Don't go! I'm dying. 
Save me. The man stiffened. His back was affixed with her soft and warm body. She greedily placed her small face on his back and lustfully roped around his waist as she whimpered, Don't go. Save me. Save me, Elrich. Save me. He could no longer step away. He slowly turned around. She took this opportunity to throw herself into his arms. She encircled his shoulders with her arms and plastered her feeble and delicate body on him. It was as if, by doing this, the fire within her would be assuaged. Only then did he realize how scalding hot her delicate body was. Stefan was startled and lifted his eyes in surprise. He reached out, grabbed her chin, and pulled her face closer. He lowered his head to scrutinize her and saw that her eyes were a bottomless pit of strain and confusion. He could tell that something was off with her. While he was lost in his thoughts, Monica tightly held his shoulders and pushed her crimson face into his, eagerly reaching for his lips. He narrowed his eyes and tried to duck, but she smothered his neck and refused to let him do so. Without hesitation, she broke into his lips. Kisses were unrestrained, yet they lacked skills. They were callow, clumsy, and slightly desperate. Compelled by the menacing desire within her, she ravaged cold, thin lips like a demon. Her teeth gnawed at his moist lower lip. The tip of her tongue licked his lips indiscriminately. A scorching whiff from her nostrils took his breath away. Despite her unskillful kisses, his body was unbearably aroused. She kissed with wild abandon. The heavy kisses eventually made their way down his larynx, the tip of her tongue leaving a wet trail and her teeth giving a small bite. He shuddered uncontrollably and glared heatedly. However, her barren body unknowingly craved for more. The series of movements caused the dress straps to completely slip off her shoulders. The dress slid and fell to her waist as she moved her body even closer to his. Her exposed, flawlessly delicate shoulders were breathtaking and flooded his body with heat. He looked down at the coltish woman in his arms. She seemed to be unaware of what she was currently doing. He deemed himself as a man with absolute self-control. He could even resist touching his fiancée. Yet, this particular woman's provocation was irresistible to him. Save me. Oh, save me. The drug in her body pushed her to seek more. She opened her naked eyes and eagerly reached out her hands to clumsily unbuckle his waist belt. Driven by her primal instinct, her mind was blank on why she was doing this. The contours of the man's sexy face were beaded with perspiration. He tried his best to contain the anger in his heart. His body was actually very aroused by her. Throughout these ten years, he was surrounded by stunning women, but he remained unbothered. They tried everything to entice him, but he was unmoved. What he did not know was that the body had its recollection. Once it had a taste of something good, it would not forget. He had no idea what this woman possessed that could remind him strongly of what he had once tasted. Her small, trembling hands were running afoul in his arms. She moved crudely and chaotically. Frowning slightly, she tried to follow her instinct, but did not seem to know how to proceed. His throat tightened at this. An electrifying and numbing sensation shot through his loin. This woman was out to get him out of control. So unbearable. So unbearable. Help me. Help me quickly. She did not know how to continue. She kissed him with quivering lips, asking for his help. Save him quickly. Yes? Please, save me, all right? Oh, it's so unbearable. She stood up and circled his waist with her pale and beautiful arms. Her lips, like lilies, pressed against his and completely destroyed his last bit of sanity. He lifted his hand and dug into her hair. Hooping the back of her neck with his palms, he pulled her closer to him. He bowed and bit her lower lip ferociously. His cold gaze locked onto her face. Remember, you asked for this. Grabbing her flimsy waist, he held her firmly in place with his powerful arms. Episode 26, More Than Romance Monica followed her instincts, her hands firmly clinging to his shoulders. As if their blood and bones were merging, the pair intimately snuggled, leaving no gaps between them. He slammed her against the cold wall, and Monica involuntarily squealed in pain. Lowering his head, 
Stefan captured her lips and explored the insides of her mouth with the tip of his tongue. At that moment, one could only exalt God's holiness and intelligence. He crafted men to be strong and seductive, and women to be gentle and beautiful. The perfect harmony between man and woman emerged from here. Stefan held her cheeks tightly, seemingly wanting her to know that he had purposely been rough with her. Simply put, he was not gentle at all. He wanted her to be more alert. It was best if she was completely sober, so she could take a good look at who he was and at how he would own her. He hated this woman's poor. He absolutely hated her casual and frivolous behavior. If he had not appeared in the nick of time, what would have happened in this room tonight? If she were not with him at present, then how would she display her charms to another man? Just thinking about it made his blood boil uncontrollably. He held her soft hips and bit her lips even more brutally. She was no longer that young virgin, and even more so, her body was no longer that underdeveloped like six years ago. After going through breastfeeding, she had developed beautiful figure. His aggressiveness caused pain to Monica. She was unable to control herself and let out a soft moan. She almost lacked oxygen from his aggressive wave of attacks. Her small hands clung tightly to his neck. As she drowned herself in pleasure, her lips caressed his earlobe, her tempting breaths drawing close to his ear. He nearly lost control of himself. Damn this woman. She was absolutely a butterfly demon disguised as a human, just like those wicked concubines that led kingdoms to their downfall in ancient times. His movements became more aggressive. Monica was in so much pain that she kept panting. She subconsciously tried to push his shoulders away and cautioned him with a soft voice. No, you're hurting me. What? Isn't that what you want? Stefan smirked and became even more unrestrained. His strength was not diminishing at all. It was painful, yet the pain was eventually numbed by the burning fire in their bodies. An unexpected restlessness provoked every part of their bodies uncontrollably. Somewhat helpless, she clung onto him even tighter. Tears flowed down, and her clear eyes were now shrouded in mist. They were a mess, an absolute mess. They were in such a messy state that everything in her vision was blurry. She could only follow her instincts and continuously seek more. She lost herself. He held her sturdily while he endured. He patiently moved to the next step, as if he were teasing her intentionally. His hand caught her jaw. He furiously bit her lower lip, and then he sneered. Want it? Come up with an idea, then. The two faced each other in intimacy. It was a sensation beyond comparison. She instantly lost everything, even her identity. Her breathing gradually hastened as her mind was in complete delirium. Following her instincts, she held his shoulders with all her strength until finally she completely gave in. It felt as though the void in her was filled at once. A feeling of enchantment, like ocean waves, came crashing in abruptly. She struggled to lift her head, her brows knitting a little. There was a moment when she was conscious before she drowned herself in yet again. Her body recovered well. For the past six years, her body had not been touched even once by anyone else. She was lovely beyond words. Under the influence of drugs, everything was in chaos. Stefan tightened his throat and smacked her lips. The two looked like they were surrounded by intense flames. The man's cold sweat constantly dripped, making her thick and black lashes moist. They were perfectly melting into each other's embrace. Both of them were extremely sensitive. The entire room was filled with lust. The two bodies intertwined with each other when they soon covered themselves in sweat. Their bodies were completely drenched in sweat. This stifling feeling was akin to them intensely melting into each other, as if they were imprinting one's body onto the other. It was extremely splendid and absolutely pleasant. Almost immediately after, an indescribable joy crashed in like waves. Monica, who was drowning in pleasure, climbed over his shoulders and clutched at his broad palms. She interlaced her fingers with his and let his hands to cradle her scalding cheeks. His palms were somewhat rough and clammy, yet they gave a colossal feeling of security. Almost tremblingly, she stuck her lips on his thin, chilly ones. Contact was gentle and warm, and it made his heart race. Stefan's breathing hitched, 
who was actually mesmerized by this intimate and gentle kiss, which was similar to the ones shared by couples. He did not shun away this time, and instead, firmly planted his lips onto hers. It was a kiss right down the throat. He closed his eyes and then opened them. His black orbs scrutinized the alluring woman that was like a flower blooming beneath him. He dominated her and made her his slave in bed, taking her as his own to the best of his abilities. She let out a breath as her lips cracked open, and it was rushed. He plunged his face into her neck, sniffing the fragrance in her hair. As if white light flashed across their minds, the two were eventually pushed toward the gorgeous skies by these extreme tides. One had to admit that the love-hunting powder's effects were pretty strong. He held her down and willfully went into her thrice before the effects of the drug wore off. When he returned to his senses after the lingering pleasure, the sky was already bright. The person in his embrace had the powder's effects worn off. She was so fatigued that she slept. Her pair of delicate and slender arms were tightly wrapped around his hips. Both of them were wet and sticky from head to toe. Her long and half-moist hair stuck to his chest, making him a little ticklish. Looking at her, she had a body full of hickeys and purple marks from him. Every mark was proof of his aggressive attacks on her the entire night. He must be crazy. He must be crazy to do this. Having been engaged for three years, he was always better than others at self-control and had not once touched women before. Yet, he lost himself on this woman repeatedly. His heart was clearly against intimacy, but even before, he never had that so-called self-control when it came to this woman, who was the biological mother of little Sam. Stefan cast his eyes on her delicate body. She was really skinny, so skinny that when his large palms gently covered her cheeks, her face was easily obscured and engulfed. He wondered how she had lived these past six years and how her life went by. That astronomical sum he had given her was almost equivalent to a lifetime's paycheck for a normal person. It should be enough to let her get by her entire life. However, she looked frailer compared to six years ago. Her facial color was also somewhat ashen, and her hips could be held in one hand. She was very fragile. In these past six years, had she completed her education, found a decent job, had a proper family, or perhaps gotten married? His heart suddenly thumbed erratically at the thought of this. Some unfamiliar feelings surged within him. Was she married? Damn it. He was actually very concerned about this question. Episode 27, The First Conversation Between Father and Son Monica, who was sound asleep, did not know that she was in the arms of a godlike man. He was staring at her restful countenance with a heart tightened in knots. He helplessly sighed. Looking at the traces of bruising on her body, he decided to wash up with her. He stood up, carried her into the bathroom, and then prepared to give her a good shower. For over twenty years, he was the king in the eyes of many. Someone born with a silver spoon, he was well fed and fastidiously cared for. He did not need to serve anyone. He even left his beloved son's care to the nanny and only provided his son with his material needs. Hence, his current actions were very clumsy. He even accidentally scratched her a few times. Despite being deep in her sleep, she let out a disgruntled moan like a helpless little kitten. She might even be cockatishly making a silent protest. Women were delicate creatures, and she was no exception. No woman out there disliked being cared for and pampered, but her life was unfortunately full of ups and downs, so nobody had truly cared for her. His heart softened when he saw her slight frowns, and his actions subsequently became gentler. At the same time, he called for room service and ordered the grubby bed sheets to be changed. If she were sober and awake right now, she would hang her head in shame at the sight of the bedsheets that seemed to have borne the brunt of war. When he carried her out of the bathroom, the bed was already neatly made. She remained asleep as he laid her on the bed. In the early morning, his assistant delivered his attire. A dress, an expensive one at that, was sent along as well. He had a board meeting to attend this morning, 
so he did not intend to extend his stay. He changed into his expensive and stylish suit, and once again, he was the elite leader of the Makewell Financial Group. Despite the night of wild population, there was not the slightest trace of exhaustion in him. He turned to leave and heard a loud ringing sound. He moved to ignore the ringing sound, but noticed that it was from the phone in her dress pocket, which was lying on the sofa. The ringing of the phone echoed continuously. The person in the bed seemed to be getting disturbed by the noise as she turned in her sleep with a frown. Obviously, the racket was waking her up. He frowned frigidly and strode over. Taking out the phone from the pocket, he unhesitatingly hung up the call. The screen flashed to display the ID of the caller. The man looked down and saw that it was a missed call from Andy, an eyebrow of his slightly lifted. This was clearly a nickname of a child. A thought came into his mind. Don't tell me she already has a child. When Andres was five, Monica got him a kitty phone. It was light and came with simple functions. It was for daily messaging and came with an alert function. She got this for Andres to contact her in cases of emergency. Such a phone was not cheap. She bought it despite that. This phone could come in handy at critical moments for her child. She was ever willing to splurge on her child's care. He was still in shock when the phone rang again. The word Andy popped up on the screen once more. He did not hang up, but chose to answer the call this time. Once the phone connected, a soft and tender voice came through it. Mom? Mommy? Where are you? Andy can't find you, Mommy. The person on the other end seemed to have just woken up as the voice sounded dopey and childlike. Mommy? Stefan was shocked. Does this woman actually have a child? Was she already married with kids? It was unlikely, though. If she were married, she would not visit sleazy places like this at night, would she? She would also not let herself be booked for a night of fun by a mobster for $20,000. Ridiculous. Mommy? Mommy? Are you there? The silence made the kid scared, and his voice hinted at it. Mommy? Are you there? Please answer Andres. He grimaced, glancing at the woman soundly asleep in the bed. He replied coolly, Your mommy is with me. His deep and frigid voice sounded mature and regal, yet it still terrified Andres. The little fellow questioned in a guarded voice, Who are you? Are you a bad guy? An alert mind with the child's special trait. Stefan nodded his chin and pondered on. I am. He did not know how to answer the child's question. He could not explain his relation to her. Was he your employer? He was that six years ago. But he was no longer that in the present. He wondered, half in jest, if he was her master now. Why is mommy at your place? The little fellow asked anxiously. Your mommy is busy with something. He gave a cursory excuse as he did not want to waste his time with the child. Really? Did I disturb mommy at work? The child asked tentatively. Amazingly, the little fellow actually believed this crappy lie. He subconsciously associated something with work. What a guileless child. No. He softened his tone. When talking with this child, he was somehow not his usual chilly self. Mommy works so hard. Uncle, please don't let her take the night shift, yes? Andres feels worried when I can't find Mommy at night. The child's bubbing and pure voice faintly reminded him of his son, Sam Lewis. He sounded just like him when he was teased. It sounded like heaven child inherit her beautiful voice? He hummed like a little kitten when peevish. Night shift? Andres uttering the words night shift somehow irked him. Last night was no coincidence then. She really frequented these sort of sleazy places like a busy butterfly. She was just like one of those distasteful women who surrounded themselves with rich men. What a prodigal woman indeed. She looked pure and innocent on the outside, yet she was vulgar on the inside. He didn't have the heart to turn down the boy's call, so he simply told him, Okay, I understand. I will not allow your mother to work at night. Really? Uncle, do you make the decisions in the company? Yes. Andre suddenly burst out laughing. <laughs> that must imply that Uncle is in charge. Can you give my mommy a pay raise and a bonus at the end of the year because she has always been diligent? What about a motivational prize on International Women's Day or Mother's Day? Can you also give her some incentives? As the boss, you must be generous. 
That way your employees will be more motivated to work for you, okay? What a sly little rogue. Episode 28, The Panic After the Confusion What an impish little fellow. Stefan was rather dumbfounded. The kid could listen to him. Sure, I will give her a pay raise. It just took this one line to coax the child. He was able to saddle the child with this line, just like how he would do with little Sam. When he was about to hang up, the little fellow clipped like an adult. Uncle, do take care of my mommy. Thank you. After hanging up, Andre stared at the phone in his hand, and his gaze turned pensive. When Monica did not return last night, he was unable to sleep well. He was worried when he could not find her even in the morning, so he lied about being sick and requested to be excused from school, and the teacher readily agreed. In his kindergarten, he was not the same as how he appeared before his mother. There, he was recognized as a prodigy. Even the teacher was amazed. Not only was he exceptionally talented, but he was also mature and collected for his age. Although he looked like an innocent bud to his mother, and seemed to be no different from any five- or six-year-olds, his intellect was well known to his teacher and classmates. While other kids his age were struggling to count to ten, he was already solving math questions. Even high school students had trouble solving. It sounded fantastical, yet it was the truth. The reality was that he was already a member of Mensa International, despite not having reached the age of seven. This international organization brought together all the brilliant geniuses in the world. It boasted as the world's top genius association with having a high IQ as the only membership criterion. In this organization, he was the youngest among those with the highest IQ. He had even more shocking secrets behind him. He, however, did not dare show this side of him to his mother, because the latter liked his cute and lovely side. If it were possible, he would be his mother's little cutesy boy for the rest of his life. Although he sounded pacified when he hung up the phone, his brows were actually furrowed as he mulled over the matter, which he knew was not simple. The man on the other end was suspicious. Meanwhile, Stefan glanced at the outdated handphone in his hand. He removed the SIM card from its slot and proceeded to throw the phone into the trash can. He turned around, opened the door, and strode off. He did not know that his overnight stay outside caused the Lewis residence to lose its sleep. Gracia waited for him to return home for an entire night, yet even at dawn, there was still no sign of him. She sat in the dining hall frigidly and stonily. She was so angry that she wanted to smash something. The servants moved cautiously around her to avoid drawing flax from her. He had a fixed schedule. Even if he had a big case to settle, he would still return home to deal with it when night fell. This was because he would accompany little Sam for dinner, revision, homework, etc. every night. This had never changed. However, for the first time, he missed this appointment with his son last night. Little Sam sulked the whole night. He did not do his homework and refused to have dinner. He was so used to his father's company, so when he did not return home, his mood was terribly affected. Thus, he unhappily left for school this morning. Although he had yet to tie the knots with her, he would at least return home on time for little Sam. What happened last night that could be more important than little Sam? Her heart tightened in frustration. In a fit of anger, she threw the glass of milk on the floor. The glass splattered, and a splinter cut across the face of a servant. Young mistress, don't be angry. Master must have been held up by something important. Something important? What could be so important that he needed to stay outside for an entire night? Gracia laughed hysterically, revealing the sinews on her face. Her uneasiness abounded. It seemed that what she cherished would be robbed from her. She bit her lower lip as she felt a strong sense of foreboding. Alcohol could be such an irritating thing. This was even more so for a very lightweight drinker. It was already two o'clock in the afternoon when Monica woke up. She opened her sleepy and fatigued eyes and saw the lavishly decored suite. She dazzledly tried to recall what she was doing there, but her mind was blank. She remained dazed even after the night of debauchery and could not recognize the sight before her. The side effects of the drug wiped off any recollection of last night's events. She could only vaguely remember being forced to drink half a glass of liquor and falling unconscious. She could not recall anything after that. 
Her body was tired and dehydrated, yet she failed to draw a logical guess about last night's events from that. Why was she lying naked in bed here? She was filled with deep fear and shock. She was so beaten up after last night's ferocious lovemaking. She was unaware of this, though. She moved to get up and felt an ache between her legs. A sharp pain coursed through her. Her heart went boom. This feeling was not new to her. This was obviously a feeling that came only after making love. Her eyes turned dull. She swiftly jerked open the quilt and was startled to see her body full of bruises. The dense lihickies and pitch scars were like horrifying poisonous bites. Her heart jumped in that instant, and she froze. In the dressing mirror, her face resembled a cracked mask that was on the verge of being smashed. She finally realized what had happened to her. Although she had not been touched by a man in the past six years, she was no longer that young and naive 16-year-old girl. The aching sensation told her of last night's activity. She was vexed and tried to recall every scene of yesterday, but her memory could only go up to that moment when she was forced to drink liquor. She only remembered Frank Hughes. Was it him? Oh, God! What trouble did she get herself into? Emma owed him money. Did that mean she had to suffer because she was her sister? She was struck with great despair and uncontrollably shook with fear. As she lay there stonily, a respectful and familiar voice sounded. Thames, you're awake at last. Monica was startled by the abrupt voice and turned to look in astonishment. She saw a figure sitting on the sofa, well-mannered, dressed in crisp office attire and had neatly tied up hair. The person was a woman through and through. Episode 29, First Meeting with the Employer She saw a figure sitting on the sofa, well-mannered, dressed in crisp office attire and had neatly tied up hair. The person was a woman through and through. She was in a state of shock earlier and did not recognize that other person in the room. She squinted to get a better look at the figure, but the room's dim light prevented her from seeing her face clearly. Her voice sounded familiar, though. She stayed still. You are? The person stood up upon realizing that she was fully conscious. She walked toward the window and drew the curtains open. As the light streamed in, the woman turned around politely. Monica finally had a chance to take a careful look at her. She looked very familiar. She probably saw this woman before, but could just not recall it. Secretary Rema saw that she was still dazed and ignored her questioning look. She took a glass of warm water and a small tablet from a nearby table and respectfully handed them over to her. Miss Thames, please take this medicine. After what had happened last night, Monica was suspicious of anything given to her by strangers. She stared at the woman and refused to take the drug. Secretary Rema understood her concerns and smiled. Rest assured, this is a morning after pill. I'm sure Miss Thames doesn't want any complications, so please take this medicine. Dumbfounded, Monica flushed the pill down her throat with warm water. After taking the pill, her lips trembled from anxiety. Secretary Rama wasted no time in bringing out a fresh set of clothes, complete with underclothes, for her to change into. All fit perfectly. Monica blushed and fidgeted with the underclothes. The secretary understood her action and left the room discreetly. Only then did she change into the new articles of clothing. Monica opened the door and saw the secretary standing outside. Seeing that she had finished changing clothes, the secretary asked with a polite smile, Miss Thames, are you ready? The secretary's smile brought back memories tucked deep within her. This woman was obviously... She widened her eyes in disbelief and pointed a stiff finger at the secretary. You are? Did this woman really just feed her that morning after pill? How ironic. Six years ago, because of the contract, this woman was on her hands and feet to protect the babies in her womb. Six years later, at this very moment, she assisted her into taking a morning after pill. Secretary Rema did not respond to her shocked reaction and instead smilingly said, director wants to see you. I refuse. She rejected immediately, adding, I don't want to see him. I refuse. She would not forget about this woman, and in fact, remembered her very well. Although she did not immediately recognize her, she easily recalled the employer's secretary, who had been with her through that eight-month-long pregnancy. Nonetheless, her heart was still filled with anxiety and many questions. 
She did not understand why this woman was the first person she saw this morning. What actually happened last night? Was it connected to that man in any way? How could that be? That was an absurd thought. However, if not for that, then what was this about? Andres! Did that man find out about Andres' existence? And did he look for her to take back Andres? Was he looking to settle the score with her for hiding Andres' survival from him? Andres! Oh God! No one could take him away from her! This was when Monica realized that it was already the afternoon. If Andres did not see her when he woke up this morning, he would be very worried. She promptly reached out for her handphone in her pocket, but recalled that she was not wearing her previous clothes. Her phone was missing. She moved to enter the room again to search for it, but was stopped by the secretary. Miss Thames, what are you trying to do? I'm looking for my phone. She took great care not to mention her son. She fretted over him in her mind. Rama Clark took out a brand new phone from a briefcase and passed it over to her. She then smilingly said, This is your phone. The card is inside. The phone was the latest model from Apple. It came with a big screen, fast 4G network, and even a fingerprint lock. It was worth a few thousand dollars. She was only willing to buy herself a functional phone that cost a few hundred dollars and would never splurge on such a phone that cost a couple of thousands of dollars. For me? She was dumbstruck. Why was she given a phone? Yes, your old phone broke, so the director wants you to have this. Please accept it. She was bewildered. How could her phone break? It was working just fine last night. She, of course, did not know that Stefan had thrown away her outdated phone. She was jittery. The phone felt warm in her hand, despite it being cool to the touch. She directly wondered if the man involved with her last night was this director. Rema Clark was his secretary. If it did not concern him, this woman would not be here to take care of these things. In that regard, she did not have the slightest impression of the man. She was wearing a blindfold that night six years ago, so she never saw his face. She could only make out his tall and sturdy silhouette under the faint moonlight. Tall, broad, and handsome, his shape was perfect and almost godlike. However, that night was a nightmare that she could not forget in the past six years. She had constant nightmares for six years as she tried hard to forget that shameful past. Were not for Andre's existence, she would probably not be reconciled with that event even now. She kept telling herself that it had all passed, yet she was still traumatized by it. Hence, in the past six years, although she did not lack suitors, she kept them all at bay. She did not need any men. Andres was enough for her. Andres would be her support for the rest of her life. Thus, no matter what, she would protect Andres. She would not allow that man to take Andres away from her. However, it was as if lightning had struck her when she finally did see the director. She was very unwilling to meet the man, but was still made to go in the end. The extended Bentley's door was open for her. Secretary Rama politely urged her to get in the car. Miss Thames, please get in the car. The man regally and elegantly lounged in the back seat. He did not look at her, but gazed coolly ahead. He restrained and elegant contours spoke volumes of a prideful emperor. Monica could recognize him with a look. Was he that employer with a multi-billion net worth? Episode 30, Hard to Let Go Was he that employer with a multi-billion net worth? He was young and astonishingly handsome. Miss Thames, please get in the car. Miss Thames, please get in. Miss Thames? Miss Thames? Rama Clark politely requested this a few times, but Monica merely stood outside the car and silently peered inside, seemingly having no intention of getting in. She walked toward Monica. Placing a hand on her shoulder, Rema Clark noted with astonishment that the latter was trembling and quivering with so much fear. What was she afraid of? Was she afraid of meeting the director? Why? If another plain woman were in her position right now, that woman would surely be charmed by Stefan long ago. However, she could see that Monica was truly scared. Miss Thames. She carefully shoved her shoulder and finally got her moving, albeit with some dragging and forceful assistance. Monica wanted to run far from this man who was like Satan to her, yet her legs would not work properly. With Rema Clark blocking her path of escape, she could only reluctantly get in. As she got in, she bit her lower lip hard and clenched her fists. Bang! Car door was shut. She was trapped in his space now. She felt so isolated and helpless. 
as if she were in a box filled with icy cold water. She was utterly scared. She was scared that this man would snatch away her beloved Andres, the apple of her eye, from her. Shaking from anxiety, she lowered her head and dared not to look at him. Her heart was in a jumbled mess. Her head throbbed at the sight of him. Providence must be pulling her leg. And then, almost instantly, an irrepressible chill gripped her heart. How come it was him? He was that haughty and arrogant man who had bumped into her that day. Was it him last night, too? She could not have gotten it wrong. She might not have any recollection of last night, but she still remembered this man's body fragrance from that previous encounter. Director wants to see you. She recalled the secretary's polite words, and her heart sank. Why did he want to see her? Was her initial guess that this man knew of Andre's survival and wanted to take her son away from her correct? This possibility was so dreadful and despairing to her. There was no sound or movement in the car, except for the scratching sound made by the ballpoint pen on the surface of the paper. The atmosphere was stifling. She broke into a cold sweat, and her palms sweated. She opened her mouth to break the ice, and was vexed when she realized that she knew nothing about the man, including his family name. Despite being intimate with him, she shut her eyes. Dejectedly, she opened her mouth and proceeded to say in an obscure voice, Mr. Director, you... Before she could finish her words, she was heaved onto his lap by him with such cockatish affinity. Slobbergasted, she raised her head and peered into his deep-set eyes. The man smiled ever so slightly and forced her to peer deeper into his eyes by holding her chin. His slender fingers roughly caressed her pale lips. Monica let out a yelp of pain, and he grinned, his thin lips sketching out into a sexy arc. He wore a stylish black shirt and long pants. The shirt's top button was undone, providing a glimpse of his seductive form. His tall and broad frame made the spacious car look small. His innate noble aura subdued the atmosphere in the car. She carefully checked him out, and what she saw made her breath catch. Was he really her employer six years ago? She was blindfolded at that time, so she did not have any impression of him. Being able to see him now, he was unexpectedly younger, more handsome and more elegant than what she had imagined him to be. Nonetheless, his devilish look and seductive yet ponderous smile made her uneasy. Stefan studied with interest the unease, fear, and surprise on her face. She looked modest, and even more so, frightened, but her naive reactions were so adorable. This was not a pretentious act. Such loveliness would sometimes prompt men to pamper women. At other times, it would drive them to trample, invade, and even conquer women just so they could admire their afflicted and charming expressions. She could tell that he was brooding. She closed her eyes as her chest tightened. He saw her eyelashes fluttering slightly from embarrassment. With her small hands clasping tightly together, she looked pitiful and evoked heart-wrenching emotions. Sight reminded him of their activities last night. Her coyness and pandering body made his look that he wanted to do her for her right then and there. He with the thought and clasped the back of her neck. He pressed down on her and kissed her soft lips hard. Feeling her warm breath, he forced his tongue in and savored her flavor wantonly. The extremely invasive kiss made her freak out. She pushed him away with her small hands and fought back with fear. She resisted hard, yet it only made him crave for more. He kissed harder and deeper until she was almost out of breath before he finally stopped. Still, he could not bear to part with her. He nibbled, licked, and tried to soothe her lips, which had sledged and become swollen from his invasion. She was stunned by the kiss. She fell into a daze as her cheeks tinted with red. Her reaction was awkward and even appeared dumb. She did not know how to respond. He believed that she was not putting on a sh show. Such a guileless reality fake. Episode 31, 100 million dollars. He believed that she was not putting on a show. Such guileless reaction could not be faked. Stefan mused. Haven't this girl developed yet into a woman after six years? He was admittedly satisfied with that. At least, her goodness was his alone to enjoy. He was no different from other men, after all. 
Her pureness and innocence filled him with pitiful pleasure. Yet her seductive and cockatish persona last night also delighted him to no end. He teased her with a playful smile. Why are you so shy? His voice sounded mature and pleasant, mellow and charismatic. It made her heart skip a beat, and she blushed even more. He smiled at her reaction and said with amusement, You weren't like this last night. He caressed her tiny waist and half-heartedly lifted up her skirt. His big hand probed in invasively and cuddled her smooth back. Stunned, she quickly held his roaming hand. Stop. Stop? He looked at her with his smoldering black eyes. Stop. Stop this. She firmly rejected. She was evidently not putting on an act, unlike other women. You didn't say that last night. Monica was somewhat horrified and lowered her head in shame. This was when she noticed their intimate proximity. She uneasily backed away, yet she was held firmly in place by his big palm. There was no way for her to evade him this time around. Her heart sank, and she mumbled, Sorry, last night was an accident. I don't know what happened. I'm very sorry if I caused you any trouble. He cut her off easily. I was very satisfied. She lifted her eyes in surprise and saw a check dangling in front of her. The amount written was $20,000, with a signature scrawled elegantly below, Stefan. She was momentarily confounded and could not wrap her head around his action. She smiled awkwardly and asked, Mister, what do you mean by this? She was truly confused. Why was this man suddenly giving her a check? What did he mean by doing this? Did he just treat her as that kind of woman? She was slightly offended. She wanted to dash out of the car and stay as far as possible from him. His lips curled slightly with a sarcastic jest. Her confusion meant something else altogether to him. What? Twenty thousand dollars isn't enough? What? She was even more puzzled. Woman, are you really that innocent or just pretending to be innocent? The man pinched her jaw with such force that tears sprang forth in her eyes. I'm asking you if this check is enough to buy you for a night. She was stricken when she heard this question. She did not respond for quite some time. He took her silence as dissatisfaction with the lowly fee. Not enough? He paused, his angular jaw clenched coldly before opening it to say words that pierced her dignity like a dagger. Well, how much does it cost to buy you for a night? Villa, bungalow, Mercedes-Benz? Let me know what you want. I have everything. Her face sank. She then coldly enunciated, This gentleman, you seem to be mistaken. What do you think I am, mister? Monica was enraged. Am I a prostitute to you? Sorry, but I am not. I don't want your money. She struggled to break free. Her resistance was just an act to him. This woman was out to stir a desire in him to conquer her. She said she doesn't need money, so why was she in that sleazy place last night? That man before said he had bought her for $20,000. He offered a hundred times more. This was already him being respectful to her. If you think that the price is low, you can quote a higher rate. I'll agree. You don't need to give me such a crude lie. He coldly said, I don't want anything from you. Damn your villa and bungalow. <sighs> she laughed coolly as she fought back her tears. I don't want anything of yours. Keep them to yourself. If you're no hooker, then why were you lying in a stranger's bed last night? He asked mockingly before viciously adding, He paid you $20,000, but I'm kind enough to offer you $40,000. If it hadn't been for me, you would have spent last night with that disgusting man. She was wanton and capricious, an unscrupulous woman acting virtuously before him. An act of kindness? She was at a loss for words. Last night, she could not remember what had happened. She could only faintly recall that a beautiful man was with her. Feeling pain down there when she woke up, she understood what had happened last night. However, that was an accident. It was not for him to interrogate or judge her. Who was he to her? Was he her master? She was a greedy woman through and through to him. He could not issue her a death sentence just because of that accident. Perhaps she was a crude woman in his eyes from the very start. Do you expect me to feel grateful for your act of kindness? Her once beautiful and clear eyes dulled on her small wan face. It turns out that the director wants to buy me, she said coolly. He hugged her neck with his arm and whispered to her ear. Of course. She composed herself and said, Why must it be me, director? You're handsome, elegant, and powerful. Women flock to you in droves, don't they? His face froze. There was a hint of tension in his clenched lips. 
He was powerful and influential in the capital. There was no lack of women who coveted him. It was not difficult for him to get any woman. However, he was fussy. His body would only respond to this woman. Whenever he drew near her, he would get inexplicably excited. His desire for her was so strong and insane. That never happened with other women. As he was preoccupied with his thoughts, she frigidly continued, Director, I am very expensive. Can you afford me? He smiled and asked, How much? One hundred million dollars. It was an exorbitant quote. Episode 32. Coincidence? One hundred million dollars. It was an exorbitant quote. Stefan gave a half smile. Make Wealth Financial Group was powerful and invincible. He could afford to be extravagant, but the purchase had to be worth the price. One hundred million dollars. Are you worth that much? You asked me how much I want and said you can afford it. Yet you hesitate when I ask you for one hundred million dollars. She tore the check before his eyes. His face darkened. With a burst of courage, she grabbed his chiseled chin, stared into his arrogantly handsome face, and snorted. Men are cheap. Instead of their own, they splurge on other women. Director, don't you know that you can't buy love with money? Well, how much does your love cost? He snapped back. Is it worth a hundred million dollars? She was truly an interesting woman to him. She threw pieces of the torn check to his face. True love is priceless, she answered. Pausing for a bit, she pointed a finger resolutely to his chest. If you really want it, then use this to exchange for it. He was stunned for a moment. She took this chance to push him away, open the car door, and jump off the speeding extended Bentley. Fortunately, the extended Bentley was close to a traffic light and was not moving fast. She got up from the paved road, held her scratched elbow, and took off without looking back. Her white dress danced with the wind like a fluttering, beautiful butterfly. The Bentley abruptly came to a halt. The secretary, who was sitting in front, was shocked by her sudden action. In the capital, Stefan could have any woman at his disposal. A newbile model, superstar, or even a famous socialite. He was unmoved by just any woman, however. A woman would be so flattered if he gave her even a second look. Any gossip between him and a female star under Lewis's entertainment company would be on the front page of any gossip newspapers and magazines. Meanwhile, this girl boldly ran away from him? Why? What was she thinking? She could have all the riches she wanted for the rest of her life. Was she playing hard to get? It did not appear to be so. She was so guarded when she was with him, as if he would devour her like a beast. The secretary smiled and said, Director Lewis... She's quite the stubborn girl, isn't she? She's really different from most women. She liked this humble girl with her fierce pride. He retrieved his cold gaze. Drive on. The Bentley slowly drove off. When Monica still did not return home, Andres decided to go out and get himself a new handphone. The phone his mother had given him was too basic. It did not even have a GPS tracker he could use at critical moments to locate his mother. He had always been smart and a fast learner. When he was four years old, he could already assemble a supercomputer by himself. The system was so advanced that it was unmatched by any top-notch science lab. Although he had yet to read seven years old, his achievements already garnered worldwide attention. However, he hid all these from his mother. Sweeping his eyes across a bookshelf, he chanced upon an entertainment magazine. The image of a good-looking man on the cover caught his eye. He tiptoed to reach for the unwrapped magazine. He glanced at the headline. Mysterious woman had a midnight tryst with the Lewis Prince. The suspected hidden affair exposed. The cover was a sneaky shot of a tall, handsome man and a slender girl by a hotel entrance. This mysterious woman was none other than the latest rising star, Jennifer Lynn. She rose to fame by virtue of the gossip between her and the heavenly king, Martin Lee. This was explosive news and appeared on the front page of three major tabloids. Riding high on her notoriety, she signed on with Global Entertainment and appeared in a movie of the company. She became famous overnight in her lead role and was nicknamed the Global Goddess. Many speculated that Global Entertainment was willing to sign her on because she had an unusual relationship with the biggest stakeholder of the company, who was none other than Stefan. By luck, the tabloid managed to get the shot of Stefan. 
Known for his aloofness and dislike to the limelight, gossips about him were scarce. Thus, the paparazzi put more attention to his involvement with Jennifer Lynn's private affairs. Furthermore, the magazine would receive a negotiation call from the Lewis group each time it published gossip about him. However, Andre's attention was not attracted by this piece of news, but rather the man in the photo. Every angle of his face bore a striking resemblance to his. They looked to have come from the same mold. Andre's was wide-eyed with disbelief. He subconsciously reached to touch his face as he stared doubtingly at the magazine's cover. It was the same deep-set eyes, high-bridge nose, and thin lips. They looked so much alike. He was a carbon copy of this man. Andres bought the magazine and left the bookstore. As he walked down the street, deep in his thoughts, an extended Bentley drove by. An elderly man who was in the back seat and holding a walking stick wore a stern face. He briefly glanced outside the car window and caught sight of a familiar face. Stop the car, he barked. The startled chauffeur brought the Bentley into a screeching halt. Grandmaster, what is it? The old man sat motionless as he looked outside the car window like a hawk. He watched the little boy walk past his car. The little boy's handsome profile and his somber but noble mannerism, especially that elegant curve of his lips and the refined air he was exuding, were exactly like Stephen. Episode 33, Different from a Normal Child He watched the little boy walk past his car. The little boy's handsome profile and his somber but noble mannerism, especially that elegant curve of his lips and the refined air he was exuding, were exactly like Stefan's. He was even an exact copy of little Sam, as if the two were cast from the same mold. If it were not for the elegant, deep, mature and modest aura that the boy was radiating which was completely different from Sam's, he would really think that the child was little Sam himself. Slightly astonished, this child's physical appearance was so similar to Stephen's. Looking at the child, he seemed to be about six or seven years old. One could tell that he was from an ordinary family from his clothes, but how could there be such a coincidence? A passing breeze swept the child's bangs away. It just Thank so you for watching. His face Please don't moment. forget to subscribe. Taking a good look at the child, Thank you for watching. No Please point. don't forget to subscribe. The elderly man reached out and pushed open the door of the vehicle. Noticing his action, the chauffeur hurriedly alighted from the car and walked over to his side to provide him support. The elderly man, however, refused his aid and shoved him to the side. He leaned on his walking stick and rushed in the direction of the child. The chauffeur hastily tailed him. Grandpa Lewis had a weak body and had to visit the hospital every month. Before leaving... The young mistress incessantly reminded him to take care of the old Lewis, so nothing must go wrong. Andres was walking at a steady pace, neither quick nor slow, yet the distance between him and the elderly man still gradually grew. The elderly man pointed at the little boy. The chauffeur quickly strode forward, grabbed Andres by his sleeve, and pulled him over. Stop right there. Andres, who was intercepted by a strange man, was unable to comprehend the situation. Although he was forcibly stopped from walking, his good upbringing had him returning this rudeness with an elegant smile. Sir, what's the matter? An old voice came from behind. Child, turn around and let me have a look at you. Hearing that, Andres casually turned around and faced the elderly man with a grin. He was brought up properly, so he was well-mannered and respected the elderly. The elderly man seemed to be in his sixties. Despite his frail and sluggish constitution... His eyes were as sharp as a hawk. His face was expressionless, yet he seemed dignified. His entire being exuded an air of magnificence and intimidation. He was likely a man who had braved countless storms. Just to look, and one could tell that he was a powerful figure in his prime. Looking closely at the child, he could not believe his eyes. Could this child, who was already this big, be Stefan's illegitimate son? How could that be possible? Stefan, that boy of his, had always been heartless to women. Why would he bear a child with another woman behind his back? This child seemed to be cast from the same mold as little Sam, though. Unbelievable. Child, what is your name? Andre smiled gracefully. He did not know why, but he disliked this old man's scrutiny of him. His thin lips arched slightly. He showed a smiling face, 
but his eyes were a little distant and cold. Grandpa, Mommy told me before I left the house not to talk to strangers. The elderly man was shocked. Whether it was the look in his eyes or his manner of speaking, the child was surprisingly mature. How was he a six- or seven-year-old child? He was just like the nine-year-old Stephen. Smart, calm, and mature. Even the look in his eyes was very similar. Who is your mother? Tell Grandpa. Who my mommy is has got nothing to do with you. He ended his sentence with a curl of his lips. He turned to leave, but got intercepted by the chauffeur again. This chauffeur, who was trained in martial arts, did not hold back from hurting him. The curl in Andre's lips turned cold. Let go! He lowered his eyes to look at the hand clutching him. His lips frowned, and his thick lashes drooped, perfectly hiding any playfulness in his eyes. Grandpa, this is the staff you've trained? Andres coldly regarded the chauffeur in his peripheral view and asked indifferently, Ordering your staff to trouble a child? Aren't you afraid of losing your dignity? The elderly man gazed profoundly at him for a while before spinning his head around and waved his hand at the chauffeur. Derek, don't be disrespectful. The chauffeur realized his intention with that gesture and promptly retracted his hand. Andres tidied up his sleeve, which got crumpled by the chauffeur's hold just then, and turned to leave. The elderly man watched the child's departing figure in a trance. He knitted his brows and pursed his lips. Sir, Derek, do whatever you can to find out about that child's identity and background, the elderly man ordered with a tap of his walking stick. He must thoroughly investigate that child's identity, because his instincts were telling him that he could not be wrong. That child definitely had the Lewis family's blood running through his veins. Once he got home, Andres put down his bag and tied a teddy bear apron to his waistline. He moved a small stool over and started to get busy in the kitchen, cooking rice, washing the ingredients, turning on the fire, and cooking the dishes. The little boy stood on the stool and held a large ladle. His movements were fluid and skilled. In less than an hour, an entire table of dishes, comparable to a feast prepared in a five-star hotel, was served for dinner. He looked at the clock and saw that it was still not the time for his mommy to leave work. He proceeded to carry the clothes he had worn to the balcony. Even when he was done with the laundry, Monica had not returned home. The little boy raised an eyebrow. He fished out a magazine from his bag again and went over it page by page. Propping his chin on his hand, he glided through a few pages before staring intently at a picture. He knitted his brows in rumination. He suddenly took out his phone from his pocket and dialed a number. Right after, he took out a voice changer. This was a gadget he had pieced together. He set it to the voice of an adult man and attached it to the side of his phone's receiver. His youthful voice then took on a man's deep voice. Mr. Daniel, this is Alan. On the other end of the phone, a man's voice could be heard speaking in a respectful manner. Yes, sir. How may I help you? Andres tilted his small face his fingers rhythmically drumming the tabletop. There was a glint in his eyes. Help me check a person's background. I want to know everything that there is to know about him, including his every move. Yes, sir. Please continue. Andre's line of sight landed on the picture in the magazine once more. His fair fingers slowly caressed the handsome face aside in the picture. He then grinned. Make Wealth Financial Group CEO Stephen Lewis. Everything must be clear and detailed. Compile the information into a document and email it to me. All right. Andres ended the call and fell into deep thought. He never believed that there would be two identical leaves in the world. He also never believed that a man in this world with his exact facial features could exist without having a connection to him. Therefore, he was strongly suspicious of his relationship with this man. He had asked his mother about his father when he was younger, but Monica, who treated him as a child, had never told him the truth. She only said that his father was an officer in the army. He worked in the front lines, but there was no news of him anymore. In fact, this was not the first time he had suspected that his father was of another identity. However, he was not that concerned about his father's identity. Having his mother was enough for him after all. Daddy and whatnot did not matter. His life would not have any changes with or without the man, would there? Although he did not care, it did not mean that he was not curious. Episode 34, 
flew with his daddy. However, although he did not care, it did not mean that he was not curious. The child used to fantasize about his father, and he looked up to him with fear and respect. He, just like all the children, wished to have a happy family with a loving father and a doting mother. However, as far as he could remember, there was only his mother alone. No man was in their household to protect her. He was truly envious when he saw that happy scene of a father and son playing with a remote-controlled car in the park that day. The more he wanted a father figure, however, the more unattainable it became. His fatherly love eventually turned into hate. Now he no longer craved for a father's affection. He had his mother and that was enough. He did not need a father anymore. He had everything now. No one knew that, at the tender age of six, Andres was the biggest shareholder in Lego Holdings. Lego Holdings was the biggest recreational and toy manufacturer and distributor in the world. The company also had offices in North America. Many children looked forward to owning a toy from this company. He, who was part of the board of directors, held 60% of the company shares. Moreover, he was the chief toy designer of Lego Holdings. All the toys he had created thus far were popular with children across the globe. While other children were playing with their toys, he was already making millions. His mother did not know of this, though. He had yet to find an opportunity to tell her about it. As he was brooding on this, the doorbell rang, and then, as though something heavy had landed on the floor, a loud thud sounded. He could hear his mother's frail voice calling out, Andres! In a flash, Andres' pensive and calculative look morphed into a lovely and innocent smile that his mother was accustomed to. He rushed over, opened the door, and jumped into his mother's embrace. Mommy, you're back! It was hard not seeing you! Andres lifted his head from her arms and peered at her tired, yet smiling face. Auntie, Mommy is back! Monica dragged her tired body from the door and heard the whirling sound of the washing machine working in the background. She was overcome with familial bliss, and that cleared her wretched thoughts. She was so blessed to have Andres in her life. He was such an obedient and lovable child. She was moved to tears, and without changing into her indoor slippers, hugged Andres tightly. He rejuvenated her. Her son was more attentive and caring than other people's daughters. She thought of Andres' father and wondered how they could be so different. The son was so sensitive and adorable, while the father was so aloof and detached. Their character and behavior had no similarities at all. As she studied Andre's face, she saw the enlarged version of her son, which was Stefan, and shuddered. The thought of that man coming to take Andre's away terrified her, and she held Andre's tighter. She could not imagine a life without her son. Andre's could sense that his mother was especially emotional and worriedly asked, Mommy, what's the matter? Oh, it's nothing. Don't worry, Andre's. Mommy will protect you. No one can take you away from me. He was momentarily stunned and looked intrigued, but he quickly recovered himself and gave her a reassuring smile. What do you mean, Mommy? Of course Andres will always be your precious. She was so touched and satisfied. She gave her son's little cheeks two eager pecks and said, oh, Precious, Mommy loves you to bits. Stupid Mommy, come in quickly. As a cold breeze blew from the window, he saw her nose turning red. He gave her an oblique look as he prepared her slippers for her. She entered the apartment and threw her backpack on the sofa. She caught sight of the magazine on the coffee table, featuring Stefan's cold, handsome face on its cover, and her face turned pale. Andres, what is that on the table? It's a magazine I just bought from the bookstore, he replied. Picking it from the table, he casually slotted it into his school bag. She sighed in relief. Andres, don't buy such types of magazines next time. The grown-up world is quite chaotic. He unintentionally gave a derisive laugh. He was young, but his experience with the adult world was no lesser. He knew how filthy and unfair the adults could be. He arranged the utensils on the dining table in front of her, scooped a bowl of rice for her, and placed her favorite dishes before her. It was impeccable service at its best. Her heart was overwhelmed with contentment and bliss, as she enjoyed his undivided attention and careful attendance. Dummy, Mommy! Eat your food quickly! She picked up her bowl and wolfed down the rice in seconds. He watched her with scornful look from his peripheral view. She was so prim and proper when entertaining others, 
Yet, she was so unladylike at the moment, she could really scare others away with the way she ate. Mommy, please be more ladylike. You need to observe proper table manners. Eat slowly and with poise. She was not bothered by his scolding. She was home and did not feel the need to retrain herself. It's okay. There are only the two of us here, she replied. As a fast learner, he had learned how to cook at the age of four and could whip up delicious meals from any cookbook. At this point in time, he could easily cook different cuisines. His skills were comparable to a star chef. She had been pampered by him and his cooking all this while. She even found food prepared by hotel chefs paling in comparison to his. This made her worry even more. She could just not live without him. From one perspective, she could be considered as a successful mother for raising such a filial and obedient child. On another angle, she could be considered a failure as a mother for delegating most of the household chores to her son. Andres did not pick up his bowl. He propped up his chin on his interlaced fingers and stared at his mother with a knowing smile. Mommy, can I ask you a question? She swallowed a mouthful of rice and reflexively answered. Yes, what question? He smilingly asked. Who is my daddy? Before he could finish his question, her face turned red and she choked on her rice. He calmly passed her a bowl of heated broth and stroked her back reassuringly as he tried to clear her throat of residual rice. Episode 35, The Precious That Cannot Be Before he could finish his question, her face turned red and she choked on her rice. He calmly passed her a bowl of heated broth and stroked her back reassuringly as she tried to clear her throat of residual rice. She had to take three gulps of the broth before she could swallow her food with difficulty. She looked at Andre, who seemed to know something. Why did he ask this question out of the blue? Did he detect something? He saw how panicky and helpless she was and gave her a reassuring smile. He did not know anything. She slapped her forehead in a horrid realization. When Aunt Reyes was much younger, he used to ask her this question. She had lied to him to satisfy his curiosity, but she could no longer recall what she had said to him back then. If her reply was inconsistent with that one from before, and he still remembered what she had said at that time, he would find out that she had lied to him. She hesitated and decided to change the topic. Hey, precious, come over and give mommy a massage. Oh, I'm aching from working the whole day. She saw him give her a contemptuous look. She broke into a cold sweat. Andres, what does that look for? She felt so guilty. Andres sighed and said, What will I do with you? He stood up, sat beside her, and proceeded to rub her shoulders. She furtively sighed in relief for managing to get out of the sticky situation. She, of course, did not see her precious son's pensive look as he was standing behind her. He saw her skeptical look and gently asked, I called you this morning, but an uncle answered the call instead. What? She was dumbstruck. Is it that man? Who is that uncle? Andre's innocent voice only served to make her feel nervous. She carefully probed. Did that uncle ask you anything like your name, perhaps? Nope. And even if he did, I wouldn't tell him. Mommy instructed me not to give my name to strangers, he replied with a pout. Andres is such an obedient child. She was truly consoled by her son's answer. I even asked uncle to increase your wage, he added innocently and then flashed her a toothy grin. Her eyes welled up with tears as she asked him in a hoarse voice, Andres won't leave mommy, will you? He immediately replied, Andres will never leave mommy. Why did mommy ask such a question? If... She took a deep breath and then resolved to say, If one day your daddy asks to have you... Never! I will always be mommy's Andres. I only love mommy. The heartfelt confession from the child made the mother burst into tears. She held him tightly as her uneasiness dispersed. No one could take Andres away from her. Feeling contrite, she looked at him and said, Andres, mommy will never leave you alone at home again. Andres' face flushed with embarrassment when she held him close to her bosom, but he continued patting her back reassuringly. This was when he spotted the ugly cut at the corner of her mouth. He froze up and asked with a frown, 
Mommy, what happened to your lips? Stunned, she tried to brush off his question. Well, I bit myself accidentally while eating. He gave her an incredulous look. Mommy, how in the world did you manage to bite the corner of your lips? Please, can you give a more credible lie? She was really treating him as a six-year-old kid. On second thought, he was indeed only six years old. She was embarrassed that her son had seen through her lie and quickly said, It was really caused by a bite. She was not the one who had bitten her lips, though. His sense of discretion was as sharp as his father's. He looked at her through narrowed eyes and asked, Who bit you? She thought of that man, and her head hurt. Father and son were so alike in this way. She chuckled dryly. I bit myself by accident. He did not press the issue further and instead said with a pout, Mommy, you have to tell me when someone is bullying you. Andres will protect Mommy. She let out a laugh. This child might just be six years old, but he could be so serious and mature at times. He even appeared more seasoned than her. She did not give it further thought, however, thinking that his words were spoken out of concern for her. Touched, she kissed him on his forehead and held him up in her arms. He gave her a warm smile, even as his heart twitched in pain. His mother should enjoy her youth, yet she had to bear such a heavy burden. For the sake of raising him, she worked and studied at the same time. When he was much younger, she did not dare to splurge on herself. Her body nearly gave up from exhaustion. On numerous occasions, he almost blurted out the truth about his capability to her. He had the ability to take care of his family and to protect her. However, he was worried that she would be unable to accept the truth about him and would regard him as a monster. He checked their past month's bills, and the amount of expenses shocked him. They lived in a district close to the educational zone at the city center. The area was peaceful, with a nice environment, and was considered to be very safe. Besides the exorbitant rent, the monthly utilities were excessively high as well. Moreover, she wanted him to study in a good school. She gave him the best of everything. Her salary was thus barely sufficient after deducting all these expenses. Her previous earning of $10,000 might appear attractive, but in reality, it was barely enough to settle their monthly bills. Mommy, please don't overwork yourself next time. It makes my heart ache. I don't want expensive kindergarten or enrichment courses, so please don't be hard on yourself, he said as he glanced at her lovingly. I remember Auntie Sophia mentioning that acting is Mommy's dream. If Mommy has a dream... Andres will definitely support. Yes. Please don't frown. It makes my heart ache. She looked at him apologetically and tried to disperse his worries with a clap. Come, let's eat. Mommy is wrong. I broke the house rules today when I brought my work home. Look, the food you cooked is turning cold and it's my fault. She smiled and picked up the chopsticks while he sat beside her without another word. His eyes gleamed like a soft glowing crescent moon. She had always been strong when facing challenges and hurdles, and could usually forget everything soon after. However, she would settle last night's score sooner or later. Episode 36, Otter Disgust Emma received the much-coveted invitation letter in the afternoon. At the same time, she received a warning call from Frank Utes. He sounded furious when she picked up his call. Emma, Emma, you're such a bitch. Do you know who the hell you've messed with? You got me in big trouble. She was baffled. Brother Frank, what do you mean? Your sister may be young and harmless, but she's got the backing of someone powerful. I didn't get to touch her, yet I almost lost an arm. In the end, I got blacklisted by the most powerful man in the capital and almost lost my life. She could not make sense of what he was saying. Brother Frank, what do you mean? I don't understand. You don't get it? He boiled and exclaimed. Let me explain again. Your sister has a powerful man backing her. As for the identity of this powerful man, it is not for someone lowly like you to know. She was baffled, but quickly broke into a smile. Oh, Brother Frank, are you kidding me? My sister is plain and inferior with an unclaimed child. Good luck finding a powerful man who will want her. Just the thought of Monica disgusted her. She is just a hooker. Brother Frank must be kidding. Don't look down on your sister. She's the type that rich bosses will definitely like. 
Anyway, you owe me $20,000 with interest. Return that money to me within two days, or I'll look for you at your place. After saying this, he abruptly cut the call. Brother Frank, no! She stood rooted to the spot for a long time. In the evening, Monica brought Andres to the Thames house. She stepped through the door and brushed past her adoptive sister. When Emma saw her, anger welled up within her, and she shoved her hard. Monica almost fell over. With clenched fists, she turned around and glared daggers at her adoptive sister, not bothering to mask her disdain. Emma also shot her a hate-filled look and demanded, Can't you see where you're going, bitch? Unexpectedly, snack! Monica slapped her face crisply. Emma was dumbfounded that she dared to hit her. Furious, she barked, How dare you hit me? Monica took a step forward, looked at her with a calm and collected face. You're such a dog. You really deserve a slap. Emma could not believe her ears. This once cowardly woman was openly defying her now. You bitch. Are you reveling because my father is not present? Well, are you human in the first place? Monica retorted with a derisive snort. Emma could not contain her anger further, and she lifted her hand high to return the slap. Oh, you damn bitch! I'm gonna kill you! A loud smacking sound followed. Monica managed to dodge it in time so it did not hurt her. She then coldly laughed, grabbed Emma by the collar, pushed her against the wall, and gave her another loud slap on the face. She returned the slap tenfold. Emma was unprepared for that crisp slap that came hard and fast on one side of her face. Monica was not about to let her off, however. She gave her another smack on the other side of the face. She was the compulsive type who sought balance in her work. With her palm and five fingers firmly and equally imprinted on Emma's two cheeks, the latter's pretty face was almost ruined. Emma was infuriated. She was proud of her pretty face and took good care of it, so really wanted to strangle this bitch for nearly ruining it. She confronted Monica and both got into a tussle. She let out a yelp as Monica took her wrist and gave it a twist. Crazed, she grabbed Monica's hair. What are you two doing? A flustered voice was heard from the doorway. Matthew stood at the front door and saw the chaos in the hallway. He went red with anger. Stop it, you two! Are you both rebelling? Dad! Seeing her father, Monica quickly concealed the frosty look on her face and gave an afflicted moan. Emma is too much. She pretended to sob with much distress. Emma was speechless. No matter how miserable she felt in the past, Monica never complained to their father. However, right now, she was posing as the innocent party. Emma fumed. Her face was still chafed from the slaps. Who was the real culprit here? Monica looked weak, helpless, and especially heart-wrenching. He was heartbroken and glared at Emma. Rosie heard the commotion and came to investigate. She saw the swollen marks on her daughter's face. Mom, this bitch hit me and still dared to call me names. Oh, you bitch. Rosie was incensed. She pointed a stern finger to Andres and Monica and screamed, Thanks, family, does not accept you, bastards! You're truly an unfilial daughter! Monica laughed chillingly. Andres walked up to Monica and held her hand. He turned to look at Rosie with a cute and comely smile. Auntie, rest assured, I'll take care of Mommy. You don't have to worry about us. You should use your money on ways to beautify yourself instead. Rosie covered her face with embarrassment. She used to be beautiful, but after giving birth to Emma, her face became covered with stripe. Since she was now middle-aged, her appearance could no longer regain its youthfulness, regardless of how many cosmetics she put on it. She gnashed her teeth in fury as the little boy's venomous words hit her sore spot. He might be young and innocent and cute, but he had got quite the sharp tongue. Phew. She choked in anger. Andres looked up at his mother and tugged at her sleeve. He asked in an angelic voice, Mommy, do you know what happens when mommy disgust meets misdisgust? She asked with amusement. What happens? Andres glanced at the mother-daughter pair and replied nonchalantly, Full house disgust. Rosie knew that the child was using this joke to take a dig at her. Infuriated, she charged forward and wanted to give him a slap, but Monica caught her wrist. I'm still you, woman! How dare you hit my daughter? Are you going to hit me next? Matthew, look! 
Emma's face is swelling from this bitch's slop. Before Matthew could respond, Monica looked indignantly and said, Yes, I slapped your daughter because she is in the wrong. She gambled, took drugs, and got into debt. I lost my job because of her. Yesterday, she almost tossed me. She stopped, irately, and did not continue further. You can call me names and do what you like to me, but I am not a cheap servant girl to be at your beck and call or be used by you. I will have my dignity. I am not your slave, she said with great forbearance. You. Rosie was at a loss for words. Episode 37, Meeting Little Sam. You. Rosie was at a loss for words. Those were the words Rosie had once told Monica. She did not expect the latter to remember them. Monica looked weak and defenseless in the past, but she was different now. One at a time, she would do them what they did to her. Rosie grabbed her arm and was about to speak harshly when Monica gave her a withering look and commanded icily, Take your hands off me. There was an inviolable disdain in her tone. Rosie was angered by her defiance. Am I still your mother? Monica stopped, but gave a sweet smile before answering. You never accepted me as your daughter from the very start. So why are you asking me if I consider you as my mother now? Rosie could not contain her urge. It is good that your real mother deserted you, or your illegitimate son would shame her to death. Monica glared dangerously at her. You'd better worry about your daughter. Ask her to tell you what trouble she's gotten herself into out there. Emma incited. Dad, look at her. She's trying to frame me. Thanks Monica, for watching. You bitch. Please don't You're forget the one who disgraced the same family for having an illegitimate child. People will laugh at us if they catch wind of it. Can you dare accuse me of taking drugs? Do you have any proof? Emma had always been a little villain to Monica since young. Together with Rosie, she bullied and played tricks on her. She would often tell lies and sow discord between her father and Monica. Dad, do you trust me or her? Monica asked resolutely, determined not to give in this time. Dad, don't listen to her nonsense. You have to believe me. I'm your biological daughter. Shut up. Matthew could not contain his chagrin. He had absolute trust in Monica, as he saw how she had been suffering in silence all this while. He could not stomach how she had suffered so much when he was not around. Rosie, you are getting from bad to worse. Monica is still a child. How can you be so cruel to her? Do you still have a conscience? Emma also hung her head in shame and stood quietly in a corner. He knew she was guilty as charged. Great. Gambling and taking drugs? What a lost face. No, it's not, Dad. Listen to me. I can explain. Emma's face was covered in tears. Shut up, you unfilial child. Matthew slapped her in a fit of rage. That night, he gave Emma a good thrashing before Rosie. The belt left bitter scars on her back. When Monica left the Thames house, she could still hear Emma's wailing as the latter was made to kneel outside the hallway. Emma had never been through such harsh treatment since she was young. She really hates me now. However, such harsh punishment was nothing to Monica. Rosie and Emma had tortured her so many times in the past. Those were still etched in her memory. Pricked, poked, slapped, hair ripped. What Emma was going through right now was nothing compared to all her sufferings. Andres crossed his arm and sulked as they took a taxi home. Monica saw her son's sullen face and gave each of his rosy cheeks a pinch. Andres, what happened? Why do you look so sad? He gave a snort. Mommy, they're bullying you. I dislike them. I dislike Grandma. She knew that Andres could not bear to see her suffer. Although this child appeared gentle and sweet before her, she knew deep down that he was different from other children. Besides being a smart kid, his tough childhood made him have the maturity not fit for his young age. He was an obedient and understanding child that was not prone to throwing tantrums. She caressed his head lovingly. I'm the happiest person with just Andres, so don't mind about them. His little hands reached up and cupped his mother's face. Don't be upset anymore, Mommy. If anyone dares to make Mommy angry again, I'll punish them. She did not take his words seriously. What a good boy, Andres. My love for you isn't in vain. Andres looked at her with loving tenderness. As long as Mommy is happy, 
I'm willing to do anything. His eyes then flashed with vileness. Mommy, Andres can really protect you. Once they reached home, the manager called and instructed her to attend an event at Crown Hotel. She hurried over. The hotel was grand and luxurious. She was originally intending to take a nap at home. She was told to get ready as the artist under her care would be attending a dinner party. As she was walking on the red carpet toward the ballroom, she caught sight of a familiar shadow. At the end of the hallway, a five- to six-year-old child was being accompanied by a few servants. He looked exactly like Andres. Her heart was filled with anticipation as she discreetly followed him. Her footsteps were light as she stepped on the expensive carpet. Seeming to have sensed something, a smart-looking boy turned around and knocked into Monica. She stared dazedly at him, and her heart skipped a beat. Andres! His raven crown shunned darkly and gently under the retro light fixture. He had fair skin, rosy cheeks, hybrid nose, and ruddy red lips. The elegant contours of his little face hinted to a European ancestry, yet he still retained his oriental charm. He had a pair of expensive eyes framed by long black lashes that curled up like wings. His eyes were ethereal and charming, sparkling like diamonds. However, these bright orbs currently held a tint of aloofness. He might be young, but his imperial temperament was evident. His sharp and distinct contours were exactly like Andre's. The only difference between the two faces was that one appeared detached and lonely, and the other was warm and gentle. This child, Ribi. Episode 38. She has no custody rights. This child, Ribi. She was stunned by her death. Six years ago, she gave birth to a pair of twins prematurely. The nurse mistook Andres for stillborn when she failed to detect his weak breath. Thus, the man only took away the other healthy twin, the older brother. Matthew then deleted all traces of Andres with the help of his hospital director friend. She was fortunate to be able to keep Andres. However, as a mother, she could not forget the existence of the other child. For the past six years, she would think of that child she had never met and mentally sketched his profile in her head. That child probably resembles Andres in some ways, she thought. He would have Andres' eyes, proud nose, and prolifically beautiful face. She did not expect that the twins would look exactly alike, though. She stared dumbly at the little boy before her, and tears welled up in her eyes. Monica did not expect to see this child again in her lifetime. He seemed to be fettered between the mother and child. Sam had Stefan's temperament. He disliked receiving an explicit stare from a stranger. Nonetheless, the sight of this harmless-looking woman tearing up caused his heart to soften. You! Who are you? He asked cautiously as he eyed her questioningly. He sounded just like Andres. She could not help but take a step forward. Sam backed off guardedly. He subconsciously did not want her to get near him. The servants quickly stood protectively before him and stopped Monica from advancing. Who are you? You are not allowed near our young master. I'm... She opened her mouth to speak, but was at a loss for words. That's right. Who am I to him? Am I even allowed to acknowledge this child in the first place? Her flesh and blood was standing before her eyes, yet she did not acknowledge him. It was painful and ironic. She smiled and remarked, Don't worry, I'm not a bad woman. I won't hurt you. Sam was instantly won over by her gentle smile. He had never seen such a benevolent smile. His father seldom smiled at him. Although his mommy smiled often, his smile was complex and chilly. As for this stranger's smile, it was full of motherly love. The first he had ever experienced in his life. He was overwhelmed with too many thoughts. Still, she was a stranger so he did not want to appear too friendly. You keep staring at me. I don't like that, he warned her. He did not sound harsh and distant like always. Instead, his tone sounded calm and emotionless. She smiled, but before she could reply, a woman's voice was heard from behind her. Who was standing there? She was startled into turning around and saw an elegant woman with piercing eyes behind her. The woman went into alert mode when she saw her face. Monica! Gracia was stupefied. 
she did not expect to see her here out of all places. After more than a decade, that frail-looking girl that resided in her memory had grown into a beautiful and charming lady. Time did not seem to age her. Even without makeup, she still looked shockingly beautiful. Her youthful look resembled a high school student. Monica looked at the woman and pondered. She found her face with heavy makeup to be quite familiar, as if she had seen her somewhere before. She could not place where she had seen her before, yet she really found the woman to be very familiar. Gracia's stare was like a dagger. She was incensed. How small could this capital be? The person she least wanted to see just had to appear before her now. The moment she caught wind of Stefan looking for Monica, she had been trying to come up with ways to remove this thorn in her flesh. What an ironic coincidence today. Her crimson lips pursed as she belittlingly spoke. Who are you, and what are you doing in this hotel? Have you checked with the reception? What's your profession and identity? Look at your shabby dress. Are you even allowed to step into this prestigious hotel? I am, um, I'm an artist assistant from uh, Foxcom Entertainment. Which artist? What's the name? Gracia was not paying attention. She only wanted to get rid of this woman as soon as possible and prevent her from interacting with little Sam. Mommy! Sam calmly called out from behind. Monica subconsciously turned around even as she realized that it was not her that the child was calling Mommy. Gracia pushed her aside and walked to little Sam. Her frigid face broke into a motherly warmth. Yes, honey, what is it? Seeing the scene, Monica suddenly recalled that this overbearing woman was the one who had slapped her in the villa six years ago. Man's fiancé. She was infertile, so they had to resort to surrogacy to continue the family's legacy. That scene was still fresh and vivid in her mind. She remembered how condescending this woman was. Now she looked at her as if she were a beggar. I'm sleepy. I want to go home, he simply answered. Gracia smiled and said, All right, Auntie Kate will bring you back. Auntie Kate hurried over and took little Sam's hand. As he followed Auntie Kate down the hallway, he took a long look at Monica with pursed lips. Monica was left alone in the hallway with Gracia as she longingly watched little Sam be led away. The arrogance Gracia suddenly blocked her view of him. Miss Thames, we meet again. How are you? She backed away slowly. The woman's aura was too prickly that she instinctively wanted to keep her distance from her. How have you been in the past few years, Miss Thames? Gracia asked coldly. Her lukewarm courtesies sounded oddly strange to Monica. Do you still remember me? I'm the young mistress of the Lewis family. She did step closer as she spoke. Miss Thames seems to have forgotten the clause in the contract. The accusation was hostile and daunting. The last clause in the contract stated that Monica had no custody rights for the child, Sam. Monica's face turned ashen as she replied with deliberation, I haven't forgotten any clause from that contract, Mistress Lewis. Don't worry. I won't appear in my... in your son's life. Episode 39, Young Master Lewis. Her face turned ashen as she replied with deliberation. I haven't forgotten any clause from that contract. Mistress Lewis, don't worry. I won't appear in my... in your son's life. Really? Do you mean it? Yes, she replied through clenched lips, her heart crashing with pain. Gracia broke into a loathsome smile. I hope you won't forget what you've said today. You won't do anything to breach the contract. If I find out that you're trying to worm your way into our lives again, I'll see to it that you regret it. She gave her a warning. Approaching her, Gracia caught sight of a hickey on her neck. Last night, when Stefan did not return home, she sent someone to investigate. In the hotel security footage, she saw him enter a suite. He left the suite in a neat suit in the morning, while a girl in a dress followed his assistant out of the room in the afternoon. The face was obscured from sight, the shape and height perfectly matched this woman before her. The moment she saw the dubious trace on her neck, Gracia's mind was filled with
more she thought about it, the angrier she got. Sinews on her forehead were obvious. Bitch. She raised her hand to slap her. Behind her, a little voice coddled. Mommy, I've been waiting for you. Little Sam appeared out of nowhere as Gracia was about to send a slap across Monica's face. She halted. Panicking, Gracia turned around and gently asked, Sam, didn't I have Auntie Kate bring you home? Does Mommy not plan to follow us back for dinner? Little Sam looked odd for a reason or another, as if he were trying to protect Monica, when he calmly pressed on. Daddy said he's coming home for dinner tonight. Gracia heard this and did not waste any more time on Monica. She would have a chance to prove the facts about last night. As for Monica, she would not let her off lightly and would make her disappear from the capital soon. She would remove the thorn from her flesh once and for all. Thus, after giving her a disdainful look, Gracia carried little Sam in her arms and left. Monica was lost for a moment. He is called Sam. She was overwhelmed with emotions. It was painful to watch her flesh and blood call someone else mommy, but she still remembered the contract clause from six years ago. After she gave birth to that son, she would be a stranger to him. It was cruel, but necessary. She was defenseless against the rich and powerful Lewis family. She was unfit to be that child's mother. Monica took a deep breath and collected her thoughts before rushing over to the dinner party. Along the street, an extended Bentley parked at an intersection. This Bentley was limited edition. It was not difficult to tell that the owner of this car was someone very rich. A black genuine leather sofa and Saxon carpet decorated the interior of the car. On the side, a small wine cabinet displayed expensive wine and vodka, looking lush and bright under the lights. Andre sat casually on the sofa, an expensive stemware filled with bubbling coke in his hand. Sitting beside him was none other than Frederick Daniel, the board agent for Lego Holdings. Frederick Daniel was a smart-looking man with distinctive features. He did not look too good today, however. This was the case because of the presence of a six- to the seven-year-old child next to him. This boy might be small, but he was incredibly mature for his age. His gaze became weirder when it landed on Andres. Never in his wildest imagination did he think that the most enigmatic shareholder in Lego Holdings' board of directors would turn out to be a mere child. He initially refused to believe this fact. How could it be? When he was six or seven years old, he was playing with mud. What's wrong with children nowadays? Is it a result of genetic mutation? This little kid who seemed to have been weaned off his mother's milk only a couple of years back was already making millions. Lego Holdings, which was previously based somewhere in Europe, was on the brink of bankruptcy when it was bought out by a hurricane group a year ago. In a short span of time, it rose to become a dream toy factory of international standards. Any toys released by Lego Holdings would become a worldwide craze. Having a toy from Lego Holdings would make any child proud. No one would have thought that those one-of-a-kind toys originated from the blueprint of a six- to a seven-year-old boy. In any case, who would even think that the biggest shareholder of Lego Holdings was a little kid who had yet to complete his kindergarten education? It was too fantastical that it was hard to believe. However, it was the truth. The shareholder was always mysterious and elusive. No one had seen him before. He only knew that after Lego Holdings was bought out by Hurricane Group, this shareholder was given the ultimate authority in the company with his 60% shares. He was also the chief designer of the program currently being developed by Lego Holdings. It was only about two hours ago that he was told to meet this mysterious shareholder. He rushed over, only to see a little kid not taller than his waist. When Andres revealed his identity to him, Frederick Daniel let out a screech in disbelief. Only when the little kid took out an audio converter did he believe him. If his true identity were made public, the board would go crazy. Frederick Daniel was still somewhat dazed and confused. Andres took a straw and happily sipped the cola. He wound down the window pane and caught a glimpse of a familiar figure in the afterglow. The figure looked more than just familiar. It was better to say that he and that figure looked exactly alike. At the end of his game was a boy about his age. A woman was leading him toward a Lincoln car by the hand. The little boy was dressed in a suit with exquisite features that exactly matched his. 
The boy's only difference with him was his aloofness. Andre sat in a trance as he stared wide-eyed and with knitted brows at the boy. Why did this boy look exactly like him? The Lincoln car slowly drove off. Andres immediately said, Keep up with that Lincoln in front. Direct, director Thames. Frederick Daniel quickly corrected his words and asked carefully, What's the matter? Follow it, Andres resolutely ordered. Yes. The Bentley rapidly started and with a throttle kept up with the Lincoln. It followed closely behind. Andres, who was sitting in the back seat with a pensive look, asked purposefully, have you found out anything about the person I told you to investigate a few days ago? Yes, the information is all here. Frederick Daniel respectfully handed over a thick file containing the results of the investigation. Andres reached out his hand for it. His face was expressionless as he flipped the pages. He looked more and more serious as he read on. The Lincoln car drove into the district housing rich people in the capital, Silver Lake. The area had some of the most expensive villas in the capital. Whoever lived here was someone with high status and net worth. The villas here were rumored to be revoltingly expensive. The Lincoln car drove through unimpeded by anyone while the Bentley was stopped at the gate. Silver Lake had tight security, so no suspicious character could slip in. Security stopped the car and Frederick Daniel wound down the window pane. As he was about to speak, the guard sitting by the gate saw Andres and expressed his awe and respect. Young Master Lewis is back. The guard, who could not recognize the car plate, mistook Andres for the young master of the Lewis family and dared not delay. Who would dare to stop the car with young Master Lewis inside? There were too many suspicions inside Andres, but he was composed when he greeted the guard. Uncle, how are you doing? Security guard was taken by pleasant surprise and immediately replied, Young Master... I'm doing fine. I hope you are too. Please enter, young master. Episode 40 The father could have such a warm presence. Young master Lewis is back. The guard, who could not recognize the car plate, mistook Andres for the young master of the Lewis family and dared not to delay. Who would dare to stop the car with young master Lewis inside? There were too many suspicions inside Andres, but he was composed when he greeted the guard. Uncle, how are you doing? Security guard was taken by pleasant surprise and immediately replied, Young master, I'm doing fine. I hope you are too. Please enter, young master. According to what he remembered, the Lewis family's young lord had always been pompous and uninterested in formalities and would not bother with a simple security guard like him. As a result, he was caught off guard. After the security guard permitted them entry, the Bentley slowly roved through the entrance until it reached the villa where the Lincoln was parked. Frederick instructed the chauffeur to park the car nearby. Director Thames, what is happening here? He asked carefully. Andres shushed Frederick and indicated for him not to speak further. He then wound down the window pane of the car and peeked out. Andres saw the boy, who was identical to him, alight from the car and be promptly received by the servant at the door. Andre's knitted brows hinted at the many unanswered questions in his mind. Gracia got out of the car next and saw the larger-than-life Stefan by the door. He was not wearing a suit, so he no longer looked like a corporate general. Instead, a pristine white shirt complemented the exquisiteness of his face. It was a dreary night. The ground lights in the courtyard of the villa were all lit up. There was a heartwarming atmosphere. Stefan slightly stooped down and gave Sam a tender smile. He did not smile often. He was usually stem-looking and aloof. Only before little Sam would he display such rare warmth. His deep-set, almond-shaped eyes were beautiful and mesmerizing. With his sexy and seductive lips, it was impossible to resist him. His father's warmth was like a harp emanating immeasurable peace of mind. He had flown to North America to attend a meeting the day before and hurried home as soon as he touched down earlier. Little Sam was initially upset with him regarding that night he had not returned home as promised. They had previously agreed that Stefan would accompany him for dinner and help him to do his homework. He had promised not to bring home work-related matters, yet he had broken that promise. However, the gloomy thoughts dispersed from Little Sam's mind 
at his father's warm regard. The little fellow rushed into his father's embrace, his little hands clutching around Stefan's elegant shoulders as he muttered, Daddy! Andre sat in the car and watched the two with an infatuated look. His eyes moistened at a nearly imperceptible level. He saw Stefan take out an exquisitely wrapped present from behind him and passed it over to little Sam. Little Sam unwrapped the present with much anticipation and saw that it was the remote-controlled car he had been longing for, Lego's latest bestseller, and the dream toy of many children. Wow! This is Lego's TK01 smart remote-controlled car! Thank you, Daddy! I'm so happy! Gracia slowly walked over and stooped low beside little Sam. She kissed his forehead and suggested, Honey, let's assemble it with Daddy, all right? Yes! Stefan gave his son a coddling smile. Honey, have you forgiven Daddy yet? Yes, Daddy is the best. I love Daddy the most. This heartwarming scene stung Andre's eyes. A father could have such a warm presence, huh? TK01 smart remote controlled car was painstakingly designed by Andre's. After it was just released for production, online pre-orders exceeded several thousand. He once saw a locally made remote controlled car in the mall and played with it for experimentation. His mother thought he liked the toy and insisted on getting it for him. In actuality, he did not like toys. Toys were considered childish, and he was no longer interested in those things. He just wanted a daddy to be by his side, patiently assembling a toy and playing it with him. What he yearned for was nothing but a companion. Small hand hooked on the window edge as his loneliness overwhelmed him. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget subscribe. See you on the next episodes.